Hello, this is your host, Adam Graham, from Pretty Much the Present. And in this video, we'll be bringing you a compilation of old-time radio detective podcasts from 2010. The podcasts are appearing, for the most part, unedited, except for some extraneous or repetitive elements that are being removed because this is a compilation. As I said, these are old, so any websites or offers mentioned may not be valid at the time you're listening unless you find them on our website currently. Now, with that said, here is a week of Old Time Radio Detective podcast. <laughs> Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. Got any comments? Send them to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Please cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And become a fan of the show on Facebook, facebook.greatdetectives.net. All right, well, um, this is technically, if you count all the videos we put out, this is technically the 100th episode. Um, and you include the pilot, um, but uh, um, we're, we're, I'm only going to count the shows we do Monday through Friday. So we're going to, um, in celebration of our 100th episode, we're going to have a little something special for you on Saturday. I'm not going to tell you what. Uh, you'll be able to find out. Uh, but uh, be looking forward to that on uh, Saturday. I don't think you'll be disappointed. And I hope everybody en uh, enjoyed the bat. Um, uh, a pretty interesting movie. Um, uh, not not quite on the level with the Sherlock Holmes, but pretty good for uh, what we've got in the public domain. All right, well, we, well I'm going to go to his comment on Podcast Alley. Uh, maybe because I'm so familiar with Alan Ladd's film work that I find his performance in Box 13 so uh, riveting. Maybe because his life ended so tragically. But I do enjoy all your programs. Great job. Um, and that's from Dave in Ontario, Can uh, Canada. Uh, I I've actually become familiar with Ladd's uh, film work through his uh, radio. So it it's been kind of the reverse with me. I think this is a great vehicle for showing, showcasing Ladd's talent and voice. Um, really, just to showcase for him, I, I think that it's probably something that did help him out with his career. Uh, he also asked another question. I wonder what radio treasures are in the vault at the CBC, uh, Canadian Broadcasting Company. That's a good question. Um, I, you know, I've, I've, I see a lot of radio around. For um, Africa, I mean South Africa, and for Australia, and for Great Britain, uh, but Canada not so much. Um, so I actually um, did a little bit of research, and I came up with a, a couple interesting websites that um, may uh, help people's um, overall research. Uh, the Canadian Old Time Radio Alliance. That's www.cotra.ca. Uh, it's got some basic information on uh, what they identified as uh, the type of uh, the type of shows that were aired during the old time radio uh, era. They actually only had about six different types: children's programming, farming, musical programming, nautical adventures, performance in theater, and wartime propaganda. Um, so those are the ones they had uh, identified. Uh, then there's another, uh, there's another website uh, for Canadian Old Time Radio. There's ScenarioProductions.com, and that's the word scenar uh, scenario, Productions.com. And, um, they, and uh, they offer a lot of uh, old time radio there's, uh, for sale. Uh, there's several dramas. There was a mystery theater. 
Um, there are some more modern, uh, uh, like radio revival series. Um, one is uh, a detective series they have is Brick Mallory, uh, Private Investigator. Uh, in addition to this, uh, the CBC also ran a Nero Wolf radio series in the 1980s that it doesn't actually make uh, commercially available. One thing I I'd be interested to know uh, what the CBC has um, is during World War II, um, in the early years, I think 42, 43, there was, I mentioned Murder Clinic. That was actually a show that was, um, that was produced in cooperation with um, a, a station in Canada and a station in the United States, uh, featuring some of these early detectives in their only radio appearance. And I'd be interested to know if the CBC has any additional uh, recordings beyond those six that are, are commonly in circulation. So, great question, and I hope there, uh, there's some better documentation of the great uh, Canadian radio series. All right, well, we're going to get into today's episode of Box 13. Before we do get started, I do want to let you know about... Uh, a sponsor. The baseball baseball season is on its way, and now you can connect your MLB uh, t- TV uh, subscription uh, through your uh, uh, through your uh, computer to your television with a, a Roku player. Uh, Roku is a great deal. I I have one, and I encourage people to uh, get one. Go to greatdetectives.net, click on the Roku player, or go to roku.greatdetectives.net. But now let's get into today's episode of Box 13, The Better Man. Box 13. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Care of Star Times. Your advertisement in the paper has intrigued me. Naturally, I wonder whether you are serious or insane. Either way, I think I should like to meet you and uh, perhaps offer a proposition which may intrigue you. Incidentally, there is $100,000 concerned. Get your interest? If it does, I shall expect you at dinner tomorrow night. I shall expect you at dinner tomorrow night at eight. It will be informal, so don't bother to dress. Yours for adventure, Charles Winthrop. <laughs> There's a hundred thousand dollars interest me, yes. Brother, that much money would put new life in a mummy. <laughs> Now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, The Better Man. Charles Winthrop. Charles Winthrop. You know, Mr. Holliday, that name sounds awfully familiar. Well, it should, Susie. Mr. Winthrop is one of the richest men in the country. Oh, sure. I remember now. He, he's a regular crisis. A what? Don't you know, Mr. Holliday? Crisis was a rich king. Oh, don't you know, Susie? Croesus, not Crisis, was a rich king. Oh, someday I'll pronounce something right. <laughs> you do and you'll lose your job. Okay, Susie, it's dinner tonight with Charles Winthrop to see what's on that mind of his. Ah, cigar, Mr. Holliday? No, thanks. Uh, more coffee, perhaps? I don't think so, thanks. <laughs> Curious, Holliday? Very. <laughs> All right, my boy. We'll take care of that shortly. Oh, excuse me. I want to tell my butler he needn't stay around. Oh, William? William, come here a moment, will you? Whatever Mr. Charles Winthrop had on his mind, it was hugely funny to him. All through dinner, he'd stop eating, slap his thigh, and laugh. <laughs> and I wasn't saying anything funny either. Oh, William. And I watched him as he told the butler what he wanted. I think you have the knife. I got a kick out of him. A short, thin little man with wisps of gray hair that kept floating over his spectacles. And when he talked, he craned his neck forward like an inquisitive bird, his little eyes twinkling. Oh, he was enjoying a great joke, and I, I wondered what it was. All right, Holiday. We'll be alone, and we can chin a little. 
<laughs> Think I'm crazy, huh? <laughs> Mr. Winthrop, any man who can collect about 20 millions is crazy like a fox. <laughs> oh, money isn't everything. <laughs> no, some people die young. Ha, touche. Now, let's get right to the point. As I understand it, you advertise for adventure to get uh, plots for your uh, fiction, right? Right. So I'd say you'd like my little proposition. Well, that all depends. Ah, surely. Well, some place in this city, I have hidden a packet containing a hundred one thousand dollar bills. Do you hear me? I'm afraid I did. <laughs> no one knows where it is but me. But you can find out. I know a lot of people who would like to find a hundred thousand. Oh, I know. That's why I've thought of this wonderful thing. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. What wonderful thing? Ever been to Tibet, Holiday? Not recently. Uh, oh, China, India, Japan, Africa, Malaya. What are you getting at? At me. I've been to all those places, Holiday. I went before they stank up the streets with gasoline, uh, commercialized the pyramids, lighted up the tombs with floodlights, and made the world just one long, big bore. And? Well, I'm tired of being bored. I want excitement. So you hit $100,000 where you can find it. What's exciting about that? <laughs> You're going to hunt for it. I am, huh? Uh, so are three other persons whom you don't know, whom you've never seen. And these three other persons have never seen you. Ooh, we'll be a cozy little crowd. Oh, think so. But never mind that for a minute. Now, I take it uh, you've got a good income, huh? Not like yours. But then I never eat caviar. Mm, but you're, you're, you're comfortably fixed, eh? All right, yes. Oh, magnificent. That makes it perfect. I'll have a grand time. Oh. Well, drop me a postcard. I'll keep in touch. Oh, now, wait, wait. If you find the money, I will match it with another 100000 and give it to any charity or cause you name. Oh, cancer research, infantile paralysis fund, or any of a dozen. Or split the entire amount any way you want. Now, how's that? Sounds good. Now, what's the rest of this? Ah, at midnight tonight, after you leave, I will drop four letters in the mailbox. These four letters will be identical. Each will contain the first clue to the whereabouts of the money. The first clue will lead to the next and to the next... And so on until the money is found. Is that it? Exactly. Each of the four persons concerned will receive one of those letters at the same time. And the hunt will be on. I take it you had one of these cozy little dinners for each of the other three. Yes, that's right. Each one agreed. Each one agreed to turn the money over to charity? Oh, <laughs> Maybe I'm bringing back vaudeville. I'm killing it. No, 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 no. Now, this is what makes the plan so perfect. One of the persons is a man who would kill to get that much money. Oh, I chose him well. Oh, no. He'll not turn the money over to charity. I see. And the others in this little game? Well, no, I'm not so sure. But $100,000 is a lot of money. I've watched people grab and cut each other's throats for much less, Holiday. In other words, you'd send four people against each other to amuse yourself. No thanks, Winthrop. I'll take my hat and some clean, fresh air. Well, after all, Mr. Holiday, you, you, you advertised adventure wanted. That's right. And that's not an entry blank into a cutthroat game to amuse a cynical old man who's down to his last 20 million. So long. Uh, wait. What for? Now, uh, listen. Those other three who are going after the money. Now, now, one is a man to whom the money would mean cheap nightclubs, gambling, and everything else his stupid mind thinks is life and living. Uh, the other two would keep the money, I'm sure. Unless you keep them from getting it. Oh, but I won't. I'll watch them play my game and let the one who wins take the stakes. But you, Holiday. What makes you think a hundred thousand wouldn't tempt me? Oh, I got my money by knowing people. So? You got the chance to get two hundred thousand dollars for a worthy cause if you play. And if I don't? The money will still go to one of the other three. And I'm inclined to think the killer will win... Unless, uh, he's playing against a smarter man. Well? What if someone gets killed? How will you feel? <laughs> no better, no worse than now. Did you ever stop to think it would be the same as murder? What law could touch me, Holiday? I hid the money, I give out the clues. If someone gets killed, the money is the murderer, not me. I see. Of course, if you refuse... You can always think of how much good the money could have done. Why, you... <laughs> I'll send out the letters at midnight holiday, four of them. You'll get yours in the morning. So you have all night to make up your mind whether the money is squandered by a cheap, stupid fool 
or help some of humanity. I went home. I went to bed. I didn't sleep much. I had dreams. Dreams that featured the grinning, weazened face of old man Winthrop, thousand-dollar bills, sick kids in hospitals. They changed places with each other all night. Then in the morning... All right. All right, who is it? Special delivery, Mr. Holliday. Okay, thanks. Shove it under the door. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. It was from Winthrop. At first, I wanted to burn it. Forget the whole thing. Because the thought of people running around a city fighting over that money made me... Well, it made me a little sick. Then, well, I guess I was mad at Winthrop at his cynical attitude that the killers would always win. I opened the letter and later in my office listened to Susie read it. High swings the hunter, his dog's eye bright. Where science is king, the clue will be right. What's it mean, Mr. Holliday? I don't know. High swings the hunter, his dog's eye bright. Hunter? Hunter? Me? And his dog's eye bright. I never saw a dog with only one eye, or, or, or a hunter with a dog's eye. His dog. And why, where science is king. Gee, I never saw a puzzle like this one before. Well, old man Winthrop is certainly having his fun. I I worked out a puzzle once about movie stars. Uh, The names were all jumbled, see? And... Susie. Hmm? Susie, say that again. Say what? What kind of a puzzle did you work out? One about movie stars. Why? Stars, stars, stars. Susie, you're wonderful. Am I? Absolutely magnificent. Here. Mr. Holliday, you... You kissed me. All that in a raise, too. But what did I say? The dog star, Susie, the dog star. What dog star? Hand me that encyclopedia, quickly. Gee. Here. Now. Now. Dog star, dog star. Ah, here. Here, listen. The dog star, or Sirius, brightest star in the sky, in constellation Canis Major, the great dog. Oh, but what about the hunter? Listen. Sirius may be seen below and to the left of the constellation Orion, the hunter. That's it, Susie. High swings the hunter, his dog's eye bright. Uh Uh-huh, but what about the next line? Where science is king, the clue will be right. Uh, I don't know, but it's got to have something to do with Orion, the hunter. Uh, Listen, Susie, I'm going to find out a few things. I'll be at the Star Times for the next half hour. Okay, I'll say one thing for Winthrop. He made the game fun to play. That is, if keeping one step ahead of a killer was any fun. Anyway, at the start times, I talked to the science editor. <laughs> Say, what the devil are you up to, Dan? Hey, look, Lou, give me some help, will you? If I can, Dan, sure. What's your problem? Uh, read this. What is all this? Never mind now. I'll explain later. But Orion is the hunter. Oh, I see. Well, what do you want to know? What about Orion? Does it, does it swing high? Sure, it rises roughly in the east, swings upward in an arc, and then sets. When is it at its highest? Oh, I should say around midnight. Midnight, midnight. Okay, now what about that where science is king line? Make anything out of that? Mm, Well, I should say science is king at an astronomical observatory. At least that would tie in with the rest of this doggerel. Lou, Lou, you're wonderful. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, by the way, Lou... There's an observatory in town, isn't there? Sure, the Winthrop Observatory. The Winthrop? Mm Mm-hmm. Somebody managed to squeeze a few shekels out of the old boy to build the thing. He insisted it carry his name. So, so it all fits. Okay, Lou, tonight I'm going to be a stargazer. It was hard to wait through the rest of the day, but I made it. When that night I drove up the long, winding road that led to the Winthrop Observatory. (laughs) Again, the old man picked his spot nicely. It was dark, and a creeping, damp fog settled down in curling waves. There wasn't a light within ten miles. Then I broke out of the fog, and the mountain leveled off. In the sky, the stars were big and bright, and I came to the end of the road. From here on, it was shoe leather instead of horsepower. I looked up in the sky. Swinging up in front of me was Orion. Below and to the left of him, a white star shimmered in the night sky. Sirius, the dog star. I looked at my watch. 
The luminous hands were almost straight up. Okay, midnight, Orion, Sirius. Then what? <laughs> Who's that? Well, 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 Mr. Holiday. Winthrop. Yes, yes, indeed. You think I missed the fun, did you? Well, come on, Holiday, straight ahead. Stay on the path. <laughs> Good evening, Holiday. Yeah. What now, little rich man? <laughs> so you figured it out, eh? Why else would I be here? Very clever. All right. Here's an envelope. What do I do with it? Oh, there's another clue in it. The second. Oh. How long does this go on? <laughs> I'm having such a wonderful time, I'd like it to go on forever. But I'll play the game fairly. One more after this, and that's all. I see. You're really making this great for yourself, aren't you? <laughs> You'll be at each stop, I suppose. Oh, oh yes. And I wonder how many clues I'll have to give out. What do you mean? Well, only you and one other person showed up here tonight. What? Well, one other? Yes. And guess who it was. Do I have to guess? No, I'll tell you. The only person beside yourself was the gentleman who would play rough. Very rough. I'm afraid, Holiday, that from now on, you better watch yourself. <laughs> Now back to The Better Man, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. It was like playing tag with a, a ghost or fighting a mist. I don't know why I kept at it, except by this time I would have crawled across the Sahara Desert in an overcoat to get that money from Winthrop. When I left him at the observatory, I went to my apartment. There I opened the envelope. Oh... This one was better than the first. It said, He's king, yet a slave. And free, yet a captive. And we, who are weaker, are yet stronger. Those whom he ruled are close to his might, yet fear him not by day or by night. Now, this made a lot of sense, and it was after three in the morning when I finally gave up on it and went to sleep. I don't know, Mr. Holiday. It just doesn't make sense. Come on, Susie. Think. Say anything. Anything what? He's he's king, yet a captive. How can he be king and yet be a captive? That's the point. If we figure that out, we've got the rest. I never was good at riddles. I... Come in. You, Dan Holiday. Yeah, that's right. I want to talk to you. Who are you? Makes no difference. Can you get rid of the dame? I'm not a dame. I'm a secretary. Blow, will you? Hey, wait a minute, bud. Didn't you get in the wrong act? Sit down, Holiday. I'm not tired. Okay, stand then. Get rid of the dame. Susie, run down to the Star Times and pick up the mail, will you, please? All right, Mr. Holiday. But tell him I'm not a dame. Okay. Maybe you know why I come here, huh? I can make a good guess. Well, that's swell. Now we don't have to beat each other's brains out. I didn't know we were booked for it. <laughs> you could use 50 grand, couldn't you? Keep talking. All right, look. What's the sense in both of us running around in this rat race? You the rat? Don't talk like that, Holiday. Why don't you get to the point? Okay. You and me got the only clues. We team up. We're each 50 grand of the good. <laughs> Which means you can't figure out this second clue from Winthrop. Maybe. If you had it figured, you wouldn't be here now. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm, that's right. What do you say? What if I won't make it a duet? What makes you think you'll get to that money? Nothing, right now. I asked a question. What do you say? The answer is no. That final? You can close the books, lover boy. All right. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah? How did you know who I was and where to find me? I didn't know you or where to find you. You'll figure it, Holiday. You got the brains. But get this. I'll be right on your trail from now on out. If you change your mind about that split, put an ad in the agony column of the papers. I'll see it. So long. Well, 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 that flat-eyed character knew me. But Winthrop said none of us would know each other. 
So I looked up Winthrop's number in the phone book, dialed it, and... Hello? Winthrop? Yes? Oh, is this Holiday? Look, uh, I just had company. No. Yes, thanks for sending him, Winthrop. How did you know I did? Don't give me that house, but he knew who I was. <laughs> That's right. I had to put a little, uh, little zip into the game, Holiday. He's such a charming fellow, isn't he? Okay, you've had your belly laugh, but that's it. Oh, you're not quitting. I don't like to be thrown to the lions. What did you say? I said I... I... <laughs> well, go on. He's king. Yet a captive. King of the beast. The lion. Wonderful. Now all you have to do is follow it up. Nothing doing. Oh, you're so close, Holiday. And all you have to do is be careful. I'm beginning to like you less and less. I'm not a likable person. However, whether you go on or not is your affair. But I should be very disappointed in you if you didn't. Hello. 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 <laughs> had the choice, and I was itching to get even with Winthrop. Somehow I was beginning to suspect he had no intention of letting go of a hundred thousand dollars, and that made up my mind for me. I figured out the rest of his little note, and the only place I could see a lion free, yet captive, was at a zoo. So it was to the zoo I went. The park was crowded, kids, grown-ups, all milling around. Then I came to the lion pits, those semi-natural habitats without bars. I drifted close with the rest of the cloud, leaned over the iron railing that ran along the edge of the moat, and then... Get it! Get it! Hang on, give me your hand, quick! Oh, pull me up, will you? Hang on! Hang on, 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 Thanks for helping. Brother, they almost had real fresh meat. What'd you do, lean over too far? Yeah, much too far. And I had help. Lucky you thought to grab that rail. <laughs> it was a good thought. Thanks again. That's okay, mister. Boy, old boy, that will make a bright buck for that. Well, well, well. Did you uh, have a little trouble, Holiday? Winthrop. Ah, pretty close, wasn't it? Did, uh, did someone shove you? You guess, Winthrop. Yeah, what some people will do for money. Winthrop, you're not very big. A nice, easy shove, and you'd be where I almost went. Oh, but you won't, Holiday. You won't because you're not the type that kills. Now, your anxious friend is different from you. <laughs> I don't know what keeps me from seeing how tightly your head's on your neck. Oh, you don't like me. All right, Holiday. You've reached the end of the trail. Be at my home at eight tonight. <laughs> It was eight o'clock when I walked up the steps in front of the Winthrop home. There were little chills chasing each other on bicycles up and down my spine. But I rang the bell. Oh, good evening, Holiday. Come in. What have you got lined up for tonight? Come this way. Ah, in here. Ah, sit down, Holiday. Thanks. <laughs> I suppose you'd call all this quite fantastic, wouldn't you? You're insane. Oh, aren't we all? <laughs> I'm just able to indulge my whims. Most people aren't. Well, I suppose you want the money, huh? You're not kidding anybody, Winthrop. There isn't a penny hidden anywhere. Oh, yes, there is. But the game is not quite over. What do you mean? Uh, <clears throat> you may come in now. I believe you two know each other. Yeah, Sure. Thanks for almost making me Daniel in the lion's den. Think nothing of it. What is this, Winthrop? Now, patience, Holiday. I have a proposition. The best part of the game. Here is $100,000 in cash. Now, you two can decide what to do about it. You can divide it equally, or may the better man take it all. I looked at Winthrop. He was grinning. I looked at the other man. He, he wasn't grinning. He was eyeing that package of money. Then he looked at me, and it was easy to see what was on his mind. And Winthrop saw it, too, because he leaned forward. A hundred thousand is much better than fifty, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> As you see, I am armed. 
You two are not. Suppose we decide to split. That decision will have to be unanimous with both of you. I ain't splitting it. Good! <laughs> I thought I'd chosen well in you. <laughs> well, Holiday? What if I just decide to leave? You won't, because I won't let you. I want my fun, Holiday. Don't spoil it. He looked at me with his little black eyes, and he kept that gun pointed out at me, too. I can shoot you now, and your friend here will be a witness that you attacked me. A hundred thousand dollar witness. Well? Let's get it over with. Exactly. There are no windows in this room, no servants in the house, and only one door. The money's on the desk. It will be merely a fight over money if the police come into it. <laughs> when you've had your little uh, argument, the one who's left can uh, knock on this door, and I'll come and unlock it. Good hunting, gentlemen. This is it. The man left with me got up off his chair walked slowly toward me. I thought maybe I could reason with him. But what argument can you use on a killer? That... Holiday. Surprise, Winthrop. Well, I... <laughs> Congratulations, Holiday. Brains and brawn. Rare combination. All right, there's the money. Take it, and I'll match it with another hundred thousand. You'll match it with a half a million. Uh, uh, what? You heard me. Your pal there is out right now, but in a minute he'll come too. And I'll leave him alone with you with that money still on the desk. But you can't. I... Go My ahead, God. Winthrop. Listen, Holiday... Now, you're not a killer. You, you you wouldn't leave me alone with him. No. Watch. And I'll take your gun with me. And lock the door behind me. After he wakes hey, up. Wait. And I could be a witness. A hundred thousand dollar witness that he killed you in self-defense. You wouldn't. You're, why, you're, you're, you're not that kind. You want to play dog, eat dog, now play it. I... All right, all right. What do you want? Sit down at your desk, make out a check for a half a million. We'll decide where it goes later. And we'll both go to the bank tomorrow and cash it. <laughs> Something funny? <laughs> it's just that I, I could refuse to have it honored at the bank. Yes. Yes, you could. But you won't. All right, Holiday. You've almost restored my faith in people. Give me that pen. <laughs> to charity and medical research. Look, he gets his picture in the paper. Uh-huh. But you did all the work. I'll tell you something, Susie. What, Mr. Holliday? I, uh, I got even with the man who called you a dame. Satisfied now? Well, I don't know. He was kind of cute at that. Oh, no. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time... Through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with an original story by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Pickard. Production is supervised by Vern Karstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. Welcome back. You know, this has got to be one of the more uh, psychologically messed up characters uh, that uh, Box 13 has featured. In fact, he's so messed up, I don't want to even analyze him. Because when I start to analyze him, I get kind of uh, queasy. I do think that they may have tried to put too much into this episode. Because uh, ultimately, I think the climax was the fight scene, and we didn't really get to see the, the uh, or hear the fight scene uh, at all uh, in terms of understanding what was going on in any uh, meaningful way. 
you know, if you're going to have a violent showdown, you got to have it. Give it a minute or two, or two of some tension and some music. Don't just tell us who won in the end. But other than that, pretty good episode with, like I said, a disturbing villain. Oh, one more thing. And uh, to go back to the first topic um, or earlier topic, a Canadian radio. Canada does, uh, I, I may have mentioned this before, Canada does, of course, continue to put out um, radio dramas. Uh, I think the main one is going is right now is Afghanida. I think, uh, which is about uh, Canadian soldiers in Afghanistan. All right, I got one um, iTunes comment and one programming note. Uh, this one comes from Defendifer on I- iTunes. Gives some of the best shows in all of early radio with great commentary before and after by host Adam Graham. Definitely recommended for someone who'd like to know a little a bit more about their favorite show and voice actors. Adam has discretion and good taste, and his commentary is always welcome and enjoyed. The shows themselves, of course, are brilliant. Each has a different flavor, but all satisfy one's desire for good detective mis- uh, mystery. Thank- thanks for your dedication, Adam. Well, and thank you for your kind comment. And uh, my programming note is... Uh, I'm Johnny Madero. Uh, will this will be our last episode this week? So next week uh, on Tuesday, listen for Jeff Regan Investigator, which is another hard-boiled private eye, but a bit of a different flavor. I think uh, I think uh, you'll enjoy it. Andrew uh, Rons has helped us get a voicemail box. So if you've got a comment on the show and you would like to call in your comment, you may do so. Uh, if you've got the app, then you just need to hit the contact button and click the call button. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can dial 208-991-4783. That's 208-991-GREAT-D, G-R-8-D. So 208-991-4783. Uh, uh, keep messages probably uh, uh, under thir- uh, 30 seconds if you can. Uh, certainly no more than a minute. Uh, Andrew Rons decided to go ahead and kick us off with the first voicemail, so we'll listen to that and then come back. Well, Adam, that was one heck of an intro. This is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. Just thought I'd be your first voicemail caller and tell you that I really enjoy the show. Have a great day, and I'll talk to you later. Thanks so much for the comment, Andrew. And, uh, yeah, if you, if you want to send a comment, uh, just send it in uh, just like that. Um, actually, I've been getting quite a few emails through the app. Um, makes it pretty easy for folks to send their feedback into the show. Um, I had to get used to it at first because the subject line that's inserted is, uh, I have something to say. And when I see that type of subject heading, I get a little bit nervous uh, but it's just the uh, topic, uh, the subject that uh, is uh, sent out from the app. Uh, we got uh, one question here. This one comes from Wesley, um, who asks, uh, could it be possible to have Dragnet and Great Detectives all included with your Dragnet app? You know, that's a, a good question. Um, I, I think that the big problem... Uh, we'd run into is basically we've already committed with Wizard Media to doing two separate apps, and we've already had some people buy both apps. So I don't uh, I don't see how we could fairly and reasonably um, change that at this point. But it's a good suggestion. Thank you very much for uh, for contacting the show. I've got a few more just general things for app users, but I'm going to save that for. After the uh, after the show, so those of you who've got some other device or just uh, aren't don't have the app, um, that basically we get to the uh, it'll basically there won't be anything else further to discuss or to come up. So uh, you can go on to uh, whatever you have on your uh, media device. Uh, before we get into this week's episode of Johnny Madero, I do want to remind you that Dragnet the movie uh, from 1954 is available on the big screen. For the first and only time, see Joe Friday on the big screen, uh, played by Jack Webb. Uh, the film tells a uh, it tells a an astonishing tale from the intelligence. Uh, 
uh, intelligence department. It's it's tough action. It's it's written by Richard Breen, who wrote Pat Novak. So if you enjoyed that type of writing, you, you'll enjoy this film. Uh, just go to greatdetectives.net, uh, purchase the uh, uh, purchase the video, and let Universal know that uh, through your purchase that we would like to see more of the 1950s uh, Dragnet released um, uh, to the public. Well, let's go ahead. We're going to get into today's episode of Johnny Madero. This one is actually just r- the week after uh, last week's episode. This is from June 26th of 1947. And one thing I didn't notice here, because I've added uh, to my categorization, I've begun categorizing by what network this, uh, these is on, uh, the shows are on. Uh, and the next, these three days of programming... All three, uh, three straight episodes in a row, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, all of these were shows uh, from the Mutual Network. So, all right, just a fun factoid. Let's go ahead and get into it. This one is called The Fatal Auction. Let's sit back, relax, and then we'll come back. Yeah, I'm Johnny Madero, Pier 23. <laughs> You know, it doesn't pay to buy a fast car in San Francisco because most of the time you got to be in low gear. The town is laid out like the profile of a chorus line, and the only time it flattens out is where it runs into the bay. The waterfront goes from south of the ferry building out past the China docks, and on a clear day you can see them batting baseballs over on Alcatraz. Pier 23 is over toward the left field sign, and not far from there you'll find Johnny Madero's boat shop. My place. Oh, I rent boats, and I do anything else that means long odds and short hours. It's a way to make a living. And if you never save enough to get married, at least you got enough to leave town. Maybe I should have left town Monday afternoon. I bought a paper, and I read about a build-up on a heavyweight fight in L.A. I stopped in at Lofty's, and the boys said neither one of those fighters could beat an egg with a power drill. About 3 o'clock, I started down Post Street when I spotted a new auction house. It was small, with enough dough-changing hands to buy back Manhattan Island. Inside it was packed, and up on a wooden stand, a bald-headed guy was selling everything but his suspenders. So I sat down and back, and I noticed a girl standing up against the wall. She was wearing dark green sunglasses, but the rest of her was just about as secret as a plow on the bathroom floor. Her hair was the color of half-past midnight, and her dress was made of the kind of goods you buy from spiders. After a while, she walked over to me. Right away, she started to get nervous, and when you look like her, you got a right to be. Mind if I sit down? They're your legs, lady. If you want to rest them, rest them. Thanks. You seem to like the view. Just temporary. I'm leaving. Will you get excited if I ask you to stay? Are you going to be proud if I do? Please. I want you to do me a favor. It won't take long. It'll be a small one. How small? They're going to auction off a black leather suitcase in a few minutes. It belongs to me. I must have it back. Can you speak the language? Do your own bidding. I don't want someone to know I'm here. It's important. I'll pay you fifty dollars to bid for me. You just hired me. Just start bidding and keep on bidding till you get that suitcase. I want it at any price. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's a special item of interest: a black leather suitcase arrived yesterday. Contents unknown. It's handsome. It's beautiful. It's never been opened. Now, who's got sporting blood? The leather alone is worth at least twenty-five bucks, and it's heavy. It's heavy. It could be full of bricks, and it could be full of gold. That's what makes it interesting. Now, who's going to start the bidding? Who's going to start it off with a big one? Two bucks. Oh, come on, come on. That's an insult. Two dollars? Who'll give fifteen? Ten bucks. Ten. Who'll give thirty? Ten. Who'll give thirty? Start pitching for our team, mister. Twenty-five bucks. Fifty. Fifty. Double it. A hundred. A hundred. The man in the gallery bids a hundred. You hear them, folks? One hundred. Who'll give two? Two hundred. Two hundred. You've got competition, lady. i got you. Keep doubling. Four hundred. Four hundred. That man in the gallery's got second vision. He knows what the suitcase is worth. The big four hundred. Who'll give eight hundred? Four. Who'll give eight? Eight hundred. Eight. The man in front here says eight. Who'll give a thousand? The big eight hundred. Who'll give a thousand? Go ahead. Surprise the man. The OPA won't like this. You're working for me now. Make it a thousand. A thousand. A thousand. The man in back bids a thousand dollars. Who'll give fifteen hundred? A thousand. Who'll give fifteen hundred? All right. A thousand once. A thousand twice. A thousand for the third and last time. Oh, through bidding. So to the men in the gallery. Please come up and claim this price now. Here's the money. Pick it up and come back. I'll be waiting. Yeah. And don't let him open it. 
Whatever you do, don't let him open it. It's your party, lady. I won't even let him peek. Ah, there's the lucky man coming down the aisle now. Give him room, give him room. Ah, here he is, and here's your suitcase, mister. Want to open it and uh, tell the folks what's inside? Yeah, what's in it, Mac? Just one of my relatives. Here's a dope. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. All right. Well, we have another light here. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry, son. I was just going for the empty seat. Yeah, we'll wait for your blockers next time, Pop. Where's the girl, the brunette with the dark glasses? Uh, it's a jail term, son. I don't follow him home anymore. Well, she was here a minute ago. You must have seen her leave. No. Think about it. She must have walked right past you. Think about it. No, son. When you get to be my age, you don't even do that. <laughs> I felt kind of silly, the same way you do when you find a hole in your sock at the shoe store. But it wasn't my dough that bought that case, so I couldn't beef much. When I got back to the office, I started working on the lock with the key. The case was made of plain black leather, and it was kicked around more than Minnie's gong. Then I opened it. A shiny-looking saxophone was laid out in three parts. For a thousand bucks, you can buy a whole brass section. So I went through each piece looking for a reason. There was a paper box inside the case. It had a gross of reeds in it. Same kind you find on the mouthpiece of any saxophone. I couldn't do much more, so I wrapped up the case and put it up in my closet. Then the door opened, and the trouble had a face. This was the way it looked in the morning. He stood there in the middle of the room, and his eyes held me like a fly at the end of two needles. He noticed his eyebrows. They were bushy and thick, and if they got any worse, he'd have to hire a native guide. Hello, are you Modell? That's my story. You got a better one? It's sadder than yours. I'm the guy you left behind at the auction. Who are you bidding for? Who are you asking for? Myself. I suppose we get real friendly. What's your name? Dunlap. Larry Dunlap. Now, introduce me to the girl who was coaching you. All right. She was a souped-up brunette with a disappearing act. Now, what does that prove? Unless you find her in the cemetery, no trust a woman. Especially Claire Underwood. Yeah. What do you want from me? I'll take that black leather suitcase you won at the auction. Look, I saved you some dough. Don't make a pig of yourself. Try to be nice. I will. I won't kick you when you're dead. Where's that suitcase? You're making me nervous. So if you got an itch, see a doctor. What makes you so big? Vitamins. I know all about the sax. Monero, it belongs to me. Give it to me or I start looking. You better have a license. A sax isn't that important. It is to me. Maybe I want to start a hot shop. I'll hold out for your girlfriend. She owes me 50 bucks and I need the dough. I'll double anything she gives you. If you mean money, give me a hint. Will a hundred bucks do? Yeah. The sax is in the closet. On top. Here. Come on. Give me a hand. Give me sure, a hand. Monero, sure. <coughs> Got a hand, Madero. Now play it out. Some days you're not going to make out any better than an ice cube at a cocktail party. When Dunlap hit me, I folded up and my head got the size of a social worker's heart. Well, I started tossing around on the rug. It took me longer to stop than it took Haig to quit Jersey. I knew that sax was gone, so there was no point in getting up. I started dreaming about that day a Cleveland bellhop gave me a key to the wrong room. It was going all right, too, until somebody began shaking me. In that small room, I didn't have to look up to know who it was, because Inspector Warcheck of San Francisco Homicide is the kind of guy you stand next to in a hurricane and wonder what happened to the ventilation. Making a wish, Madero? Yeah, here, so it didn't come true. What are you collecting? Alibis. What's yours for last night at 12 o'clock? That was in bed. You got a witness? No, you can't win them all. Yeah, that's the way a guy named Charlie Reiser felt. So maybe it's an epidemic. So maybe you started it. Someone shot him dead. The guy was a musician. Try some of the neighbors. I'll try you first. You're reaching, Warchick. I never even heard of the guy. Oh, that's a handicap, Madero. Maybe you just heard of his instrument, huh? All right, let me guess. It was a sack. Hey, you're very bright. An auctioneer helped me trace it down to you. Now, what's the pitch? A wild one, Warchick. A dame forced me to do her a favor. Uh Uh-huh. I bet you force easy. She paid me to bid for the sax and then took a potter after I won it. You got an active memory. Does it include a name? Yeah. Claire Underwood. Run it down and see what it gets you. Oh, now stop threatening me, Madero. I think that sax is tied in with the murder. Now, where is it? You're a little late. A torpedo named Larry Dunlap just walked in and sapped me for it. Yeah? How hard did he sap you, Madero? Hmm? There's a pool of blood behind your desk, and it doesn't look like yours. How'd it get there? I don't know, Warchick. Maybe somebody got lost and figured it was a blood bank. How do I know? Yeah. Maybe they thought it was a morgue, too. Left a body. Now look around. Yeah, do that. Look under the rug, too. Maybe the guy was thin. All right, Madero. So far, you're in the clear. But if there's blood, there must be a body close by. It'll show. When it does, we'll turn it in for yours. I'll remember. Like you remember that thousand bucks? Huh? The auction house, Madero. The thousand bucks you gave the joint got homesick and left. I'm broke, Warchick. Yeah? You'll have to stand on your head to pin this on me. Maybe I will. Maybe you're right. I forgot about your head.
Once Warcheck sticks to you, you might as well try to pull a mustard plaster off a throw rug. He stood there for a minute, blinking at the light, and you could see big pebbles of sweat standing out on his forehead. He took a handkerchief out of his pocket, and when it came down, it was wet enough to wash all the windows in lower Manhattan. After a while, he walked out. I watched him out of the window. I tried to figure how I got into this. It was like trying to trace back a conversation to see what word started it. There were lots of questions and not too much time. Why was a saxophone and a grocer reeds worth all that dough? And who left his blood on my rug as a deposit? The girl must have known what was in the case, but why did she leave it with me? Oh, I couldn't make it add up, so I looked up the only good guy I know. A waterfront priest named Father Leahy. He knows most of the bad boys around the piers, and he's heard enough sins to start an art colony. Around Lofties, they got his name above the line. And that's a tough trick, because along the waterfront, an archangel couldn't get a cup of coffee without hucking a wing. I found him over at the parish house having dinner. Hello, Johnny. You want some wine? No, thanks, Father. That's one of the good things about this job. You get wine with your meals. Yeah, I know. Except you've got to watch out. I knew a guy in the seminary liked to eat between meals. Yeah, yeah. But the bishop fixed him. He sent him to a rich parish, and the guy had to throw away half his sermons. I'm in trouble, Father. Did you buy elevator shoes, or is that a bump on your head? Somebody knocked me down when I wasn't looking. Did you get the license number? It just felt like a truck. I got hit with a club. That's why I want you to help me, Father. Johnny, you misinterpret my mission in life. You need a policeman. I'm only a priest. Besides, I'm eating. Look, Father, homicide wants to tack a murder on me. There goes my appetite. Who's dead? Anybody I could have helped? His name was Charlie Riser. He was a musician. If he's going in the right direction, he may get some work. How did you meet him? I didn't. I never heard of the guy. It was all a surprise to me. Sounds more like a shock. I got a bum shake from the start, Father. A gal with a big purse promised to pay me something if I'd bid for a black suitcase at an auction. What was the matter with her? Laryngitis? She was trying to keep somebody from noticing her. But she must have weakened in the final stretch. What do you mean? I won the bid with a thousand bucks. But when I came back, the gal was gone. And you were left holding the bag. What was in it? A saxophone and a grocer reeds. You could buy the whole outfit with a five-dollar down payment. What makes it worth a thousand? I don't know, Father. The sax belonged to Charlie Riser. A guy named Dunlap offered me two hundred bucks for it. All that money for a saxophone, and they wouldn't allow me forty bucks on that old organ. Dunlap slugged me when my back was turned and piled up a lead. Did the sax go for free? Somebody paid for it. When I woke up, there was a lot of blood on the floor. Yours? It was unclaimed. But I have an idea a body's going to turn up without it. You have nothing but murder on your mind, Johnny. Why don't you settle down with a good book? If Warcheck tags me, I'll have to borrow yours, Father. Right now, I need you to check on a few people for me. Sure, but I'll need a couple of names for them first. You know a lot of the combo boys, Father. Check up on Charlie Riser's friends, especially his women. And find out where Larry Dunlap fits in. Will you do it, Father? Yes, Johnny, I'll do it. But if I find out you're calling them wrong, I'll drop over to Warcheck's side. Thanks, Father. If you help me out of this, you're a good guy. You're an angel. But stop pushing me. I'm not that anxious yet. When I left Father Leahy, I ran over my leads. You could have counted them on one finger and you'd still have to cheat. The only guy worth looking up was the auctioneer on Eddy Street. Maybe that was all revenge. Why did he tell Warcheck that I took that thousand bucks back? Well, I figured I'd find out, so I grabbed a cab back to his store. When I got there, the joint was locked up, but a big neon sign blinked the name J.C. Cole. There was another light coming from the back, so I followed it down. Inside, Cole was working over his cash register tape. I didn't knock, and right away he started making funny noises in his throat. I noticed he was wearing a vest without a tie, and his sleeves were rolled up with big rubber bands. His elbows stuck out, and they were red and knotted up like a baby's face with cramps. And then he made his opening bid. It's a little late. Uh, what can I sell you, mister? A straight story. Huh? The one you told headquarters had too many frills. Hey, wait a minute. You're the same fellow who bought that suitcase. You got a good head, friend. How good is it on robbery? It was dark. I thought it was you, so I called the cops. You started fast, but you're fading in the stretch. A thousand bucks was gone. I figured you took your money back. That's an early mistake. It wasn't my dough. Y you sound like you're mad. You said a gun in your pocket, then? If it makes you talk about that suitcase, I'll say yes. I don't know what you mean. I said you were taking your chances. A ton of bricks, a ton of gold. Remember, i, I got to make a living, you know. You don't have to crowd them in. What gives a sax a thousand dollar price tag? I don't know, I tell you. I, I, I don't know what thing. Yeah, well, we'll go into politics later. I think you're lying. I, I, it, it was just another suitcase, an old leather suitcase with a sax inside. I, I just tell you, I, I don't know a thing. Yeah, keep it up, fella. You'll tell me everything that way. Now, how did you know there was a sax in that case if you never opened it? Well, I, 
Now, listen, mister, let's be friends. I got a little money. Let's be friends. Go on. I was just trying to get a little ahead. I got a wife and a kid, a big kid, so I switched saxophones. I took out the original sax with the reeds and put in an older one. What'd you do with the original? It was a pretty nice one, brand new, so, so, so I sold it to someone, uh, reeds and all, for $200. You're slowing down. Who's someone, a relative? He's a friend named Bud, Bud, uh, Bud Overbeck. He plays tennis sax at the downbeat club. That that original was something special, huh? Yeah, you should have held out for a thousand bucks on both ends. Now, listen, fella, but, but Bud's a friend, a good friend on my wife's side. You won't hurt him, will you? I'll send you a pint if he believes. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. I'll, I'll save it. I, 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 anything else, huh? Yeah. Stop stuttering. You'll give that kid of yours a complex. <laughs> When he opened the door, you could tell he wanted to shake me worse than a summer cold. I didn't like him any better, but he'd given me something solid to work on. So I got over to the club downbeat. It's a jazz cellar that warms over King Oliver at six bits a throw. Five-piece combo was writing a chorus slow and easy, and you knew the only notes they ever read were on IOUs. There were a dozen or so jazz fans huddled around the bandstand, and if you looked real close at their faces, you saw something that looked like pain. I asked the bartender who Overbeck was, and... He pointed out the blonde kid with a face made of warm putty playing a black saxophone. I walked backstage to a small dressing room where the boys grabbed their second wind with a short one. When I opened the door, Claire Underwood stood there holding her breath. Hello, Johnny. You look angry. Put away those daggers, hmm? I will, baby. I'll guess that you killed Riser for a saxophone. Guess again. Why should I kill anyone for a sax? Tell me why it's worth a grand and I'll answer that one too. All right, Johnny. I'm sentimental. Say, Charlie Riser was my boyfriend, and I wanted to keep his sax as a memory. Must have been quite a memory, baby. You didn't meet Charlie. But I did meet Larry Dunlap. He wanted the sax, too. Why? How would I know, Johnny? Maybe he was taking lessons. They weren't that kind. He has too good a lip. So have I. Only I use it differently. All right, stop puckering, sweetheart. I want some sense now. Please, Johnny. If you leave now, I'll give you double what I owe you from the auction. That's not enough. Look, baby, count up your bills and tell me what a murder rap is worth, huh? You'll haggle over it later, Johnny. Just meet me at the Ajax Hotel, and I promise you, you'll get a better figure. Yeah. You gonna add some interest? Come here, and I'll show you what I mean. I'm not running a service. I need some answers. Come on, come on. I want some action. Come on. You use your arms, Johnny. You got too big a mouth, baby. Somebody's gonna close it on you. Show me, Johnny. All right. The music stopped, Johnny. What do you care? We're not dancing. Johnny, please, you're, you're squeezing me too tight. Yeah, it's a bad habit. Now tell me about that sax. Listen to me, Johnny. I told you I've got to see Overbeck first. I'll tell you everything later. Yeah, after you talk Overbeck out of his sax, huh? Yes. Is it a deal? You're too anxious to sign. I'll talk to Overbeck myself. All right, Johnny. I'll help you get him here quicker. Yeah, what are you going to do? Scream, Johnny. Scream. Listen. Louder, baby. You'll really need it in a minute. Help! 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 Hey, what's the matter? What was she screaming about, mister? She couldn't catch me. This man's drunk. He was trying to snatch my purse. Is that true, mister? Call a cop and find out. Yeah, I will. No, no. Please, uh, don't bother. Just get him out. Uh, just throw him out, mister Overbeck. You heard the lady, mister? Do I get rough? Save your strength, Overbeck. You'll need it later. <laughs> Claire had a nice act if you didn't mind playing straight man to a vulture. She draped herself on Overbeck's arm and she looked as cool as a vacation in Maine. As I walked out, Overbeck was still showing his teeth, but it didn't matter because you got the idea he wasn't strong enough to fight off a sneeze. Well, there wasn't much I could do except wait for Claire to show, but it started to drizzle, so I figured my best bet was her hotel. In the lobby, a rose-colored carpet with a touch of yellow jaundice led to the desk. The clerk told me she hadn't come in yet, but for five bucks he could tell I was a friend. He gave me her key. I went upstairs, and when I opened Claire's door, I knew something was wrong. A lot of towels were thrown all over the floor, and everything was gone from the closet but the mothballs. Claire had skipped, and before I could walk out, Dunlap walked in. One hand was in his pocket, and the other had enough tape to wrap up a mummy. Can I come in, madame? You're old enough, Dunlap. Make up your own mind. I have. Where's Claire? You're early. I think she's still busy. Give me a magazine. I'll wait. It'll be a long one. I'm not hanging around. Oh, the fun is just beginning. Sit down. Sit down. I guess I am tired. Yeah, uh, this gun makes everybody drowsy. Now, what's your time with Claire? Nothing that's deep-rooted. Are you writing a column? Yeah, the obituary, and you're going to make the morning deadline. You're too cocky, Dunlap. Don't turn your back. I won't. Claire blew her chance. The best she could do was disarm. Yeah, you ruined my carpet. When they pass your cup around, I'll be generous. 
In the meantime, you're going to stick around until Claire brings that black saxophone. I hope she's got some food in the icebox. What do you mean? Well, if you're waiting for that sax, we're going to starve to death. Claire's not going to show. What makes you a prophet? A guy named Bud Overbeck. He had the sax last, and Claire was working him over for it. I'll work you over for less. What are the rest of her plans? She was warm. Maybe she left a smoke signal. All right. You're getting too stubborn. Put away the gun, Dunlap. You can only use one arm. I'll clean the bases with this index finger. Pick a spot to fall. Hey, don't clutter up the floor now, Dunlap. We got company. Hey, what's this? The wrong room? Claire said we'd be alone. We are. Just the three of us. Who's he, Madero? Huh? What are you talking about? Claire told me to come here. She told me to wait for her. Look, fella, save your lip for another cause. Just tell me where she left you. I don't feel so good. She was at the downbeat club. She was helping me put my sacks away. I I just came up here to wait. We were going to be alone. All right, fella. I'm cutting down the crowd. You with Madero now? I'm leaving. Yeah, I, I'm going home, too. I feel sick. I'm going home. You'll never make it on your knees. What's the matter? I don't know. I, I guess I gave the new horn too big a ride tonight. I got a weak heart. Your eyes aren't too strong either. You're walking right into that closet. They told me not to play so hard. Maybe I played too hard. Help me, Fowler. You look familiar. I seen you somewhere, huh? You, you look fuzzy. Yeah. I don't know. I, I feel sick. Someone must have slipped me something. I... I never felt like, like this before. I'm sick. Sick, You'll never get any sicker, fella. Overbeck was dead even before he had a chance to see if Gabriel paid his boy's scale. He hit the floor and turned over on his back, and you figured he'd cross the River Jordan with a backstroke. I got a good look at him now. His face was all twisted up like bed sheets after a nightmare, and up near his hairline, a Long, thin scar ran into his scalp. Well, I didn't know it killed Overbeck, but whatever it was, he didn't get two weeks' notice. I figured if homicide caught me here, I'd get my walking papers, too, right down to the last 20 feet. I started for the door, but Warchick opened it for me. He looked at the body and went over to me. You on a spree, Madero? If you're footing the bill, Warchick. The state will from now on. Now tell me about the guy on the floor. He's dead. Must have had parents. What's his name? Bud Overbeck. He was a musician at the Downbeat Club. Yeah. Tell me some more. Roll him, Warchick. Maybe he's got a diary. All right. Yeah, here's his wallet. All right, Madero. How long you been here? Why? The wallet's empty. Well, that's too bad. Your girlfriend's going to have to get along in last week's presents. I trail a guy named Dunlap up to this apartment, and I find you and a dead body. Now, there's a tie, any way you look at it. Mm-hmm. That is what happened. I don't know, Warchick. I didn't see the picture. I just tagged by for the end. You know? Must have been a sad one. I think he's poisoned. I don't like the look in his eyes. Get the girl who put it there. Well, just give me a hint. Huh? Overbeck was playing caveman with Claire Underwood before he came up here. What does that give him besides hair? Maybe a Mickey. When I left, she was warming up an argument for his saxophone. She got it? She didn't. Dunlap's losing man hours. He just walked out here, and I think she's on his list. Yeah. I'm beginning to get an idea now myself. Does it hurt? You and the Underwood girl are running some kind of a racket for that saxophone. She left you behind the front for her. You haven't seen her, Warchick. She doesn't need that kind of help. But you will when I get through checking. Still got a few calls to make, and I want the lab to work over the body. By then, I'll have enough to come back and hold you, my dear. You couldn't hold a lap dog with a suction pump. All right, big shot, I'll go a long way to get you for this, a long way. You got the drag, Warchick. Yeah, it's going to slow you down a little. Warchick wanted to mother the body until the coroner came, and when I left, he was squeezing himself into a chair. He fit tighter than a whale in a crib. You can word it any way you like, but the big riddle was that saxophone. Claire had it, and Dunlap wanted it, and a couple of guys died for it. My only alibi was Dunlap, but you might as well ask Khan to hold still for Lewis. I buzzed back to the office, but there was no message from Father Leahy. So I stared out the window for a while, wondering how to bake a cake with a dynamite charge when the phone rang. Yeah. Hello, Johnny. This is Father Leahy. What'd you find out, Father? It's not pleasant, Johnny. I'm down at the morgue. A lab report on Bud Overbeck just came in. He died of poisoning, huh, Father? The bitter kind. Overbeck's heart couldn't stand all that dope. Hmm? Coroner found a used saxophone reed in Overbeck's pocket. It was soaked in hop. So that's what made that saxophone so big. The grosser reeds. That's right, Johnny. Overbeck was absorbing the stuff while he played. Oh. He probably never knew what hit him. Well, what about Riser? How does he figure? Riser was making his pin money peddling dope to nightclubs. He was getting his shipments from Mexico. Well, how did Claire and Dunlap figure? There were a couple of partners who wanted to ease out Riser and go into business for themselves. The idea must have gone to Claire's head. She's doing a solo now, and Dunlap thinks she has the sax. 
Warchek feels the same way about you, Johnny. He's out to tag you for everything. He's smarter than that. I don't know him that well. But it adds up in his book because he thinks you're leaving town. Hmm? Someone's booked a passage on the 2 a.m. plane from Mexico this morning in the name of Jay Madero. I'm being jockeyed, Father. It's either Claire or Dunlap. They're both as black as sin. Maybe so, but Warchek still thinks you're the dark horse. <laughs> Up until now, it was like trying to sell a toupee to a ball-headed eagle. But when the turn comes, everything happens in a hurry, and you began breaking more records than a disc jockey with a hangover. If Father Leahy was right, Clara Dunlap had enough dreams in that saxophone to start a waltz contest, and I knew if they both got out of town, Warchek would be around to tag me for the last dance. So I got out to Mills Field, and out on the far end of the strip, a twin-engine plane was warming up. Clara was standing with her back toward me, and even from here, you could see what a stiff tailwind could do to a landing gear. When she saw me, she raised her eyebrows and figured her temperature was even higher. Sorry I had to borrow your name, Johnny. You're too small for it, baby. I got a big ego. And that gun bolsters it, huh? That's my story. Well, tell it to Homicide. They'll take a nibble on either you or Dunlap. Better throw him Dunlap. I got a date in Mexico City. It's a blind one, baby. You're going in the wrong direction. Larry, what are you doing here? I thought you... I want those reeds, baby. You'll be peddling pencils when I'm through with you. I'll leave the sides, too, baby. I'll be lonely. You won't need that kind of music where you're going, Larry. You're the ones I talk, baby. I trusted you. We were going to do this together. I trusted you. We all make mistakes. You got the short end. I'll stretch it a little. You got another chance. Let's team up again. Sorry, Larry. I'm crowding you out. You only think so. Now, get out of my way. I got to make the plane. Make a grave first. I want that stuff. I won't miss again. Stay away, Larry. Put up a sign. Yeah. You missed again. Give me the gun. No, I'm selfish. I'll hold on. Pull him off me, Madera. Pull him off. There's a lot. All right, baby. You you run out of chances. It's my turn now. No. Please, Larry. Put the gun away. You win. I'll split it with you now. You win. Honest, Larry, you win. Just to show you I agree. You're through, guy. Drop the gun. Yeah. Uh, what are the odds of my getting away in that plane? 70, 30, maybe. Uh... Things are too tough at 50-50. Come on, I'll ride downtown with you. Well, Dunlap told the whole story down at headquarters. It seems that Riser, Claire, and he were buying dope from Mexico and peddling it here in the form of soaked-up reeds. Riser was contact man in Mexico, but the only way they knew him down there was by his black saxophone. Claire and Dunlap decided to narrow the profits down to two by shooting Riser and taking over. Claire used the gun and, well, that started her to thinking that she could do even better with a single act. She needed that black sax, though. Riser got wind of it and hid the sax with the reeds in the basement. His landlady found it after he was tumbled and sold it to that auction house. And Claire had me buy it and followed me back to the office where she tried to peg down Dunlap. The sax she took turned out to be a phony because the auctioneer had already sold the black one to Bud Overbeck. The track was switched to him, but not soon enough. Overbeck didn't know the reeds were loaded, and after an all-night jam session, he folded up with a heart attack. Well, Warchek asked only one question. Wasn't it tough luck for an innocent guy like Overbeck? I don't know. At least there was one time he played right out of this world. <laughs> Johnny Madero, Pier 23, starring Jack Webb as Johnny Madero, has been presented by the Mutual Network. Johnny Madero is written by Herb Margulis and Lou Morheim. Gail Gordon played Father Light Leahy. And Bill Conrad played Inspector Warcheck of Homicide. Others in the cast were Helene Burke, Bob Holton, Herb Butterfield, Irvin Lee, and Herb Rollinson. Original music was composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman, and the entire production was directed by Nat Wolf. We invite you to listen again next week over most of these stations when Mutual presents another adventure in the life of Johnny Madero, Pier 23. Tony Lafrano speaking. <laughs> this program came to you from Hollywood. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
the scene with Warcheck. Um, uh, welcome back, by the way. The scene with Warcheck absolutely uh, ha- had me in uh, had me in stitches. Uh, the dialogue there did, which I don't know if it's entirely a good thing, but I I, en- I enjoyed it. And this episode was actually a little better than I remembered it. It may be that this one's a pretty good quality audio, too. Um, I, I lo- love the show, but I could kind of see that it was a little bit, um, it was a little bit unbalanced. Uh, and I think if there was a lesson that Jack Webb may have taken from Johnny Madero, which lasted uh, just about, which lasted just only 20 weeks, uh, I think it was the importance of chemistry. Um, Gail Gordon did better in this episode, but he still no, uh, still didn't uh, pull off the Tudor Owens, Jocko Madigan uh, role. Or uh, I came closer this episode. I, I think that that's one thing about uh, about Webb uh, because as a young actor, uh, it was obvious that mutual believed that Webb, uh, Webb himself was basically golden and was going to be able to uh, carry the show. Uh, and I think uh, where the chemistry wasn't as strong, that really uh, caused things to not quite work out wh- how they had been planning. And that's one of the reasons why, over on the Old Time Dragnet show, uh, we're in the midst of a th- uh, almost uh, ten-month search for a replacement for Barton Yarborough. Uh, on the Dragnet episodes. And I think part of the reason he took that time is Webb did have an appreciation for the importance of chemistry, of getting all the right parts to uh, work together. Uh, And that there really wasn't um, a one-man show that he could carry by himself. And maybe Johnny Madero was part of a learning process that may have helped uh, the young actor in the long run. Uh, Email here... um, from Jeffrey, who uh, runs, I enjoy uh, the program and have for years, though I find Jack Webb's intensity and antisocial behavior immense mu- much. Would like to hear the other actor who performed as Pat Novak. I've heard him before and liked him a great deal. Well, thanks uh, for the email, Jeffrey. I have to say, I've heard uh, the other actor, oh, was Ben Morris. I've heard uh, his performance, and uh, um, I didn't, I didn't really quite care for him. Now I, I have to admit uh, I was comparing it to the um, uh, to the Pat uh, to the Pat Novak done by Jack Webb. Um, I and I think what hap- what happened there is you had not only Webley but you had the writer leave Richard Breen, and so you had this radio station they thought they could just you know have a new writer have a new star and carry on like it had before and it didn't seem to work to me um but i I can take a listen to it maybe i get a little bit away from the jack webb version of uh pat novak and can evaluate this kind of on its own merits i'm kind of ready to move away from the san francisco bay for a while that's why next week we're going to start on jeff regan but I'll I'll take a listen after I've been away from the web version of Pat Novak and see if maybe I changed my mind. Uh, thanks for the email. We also got a great love the show comment off of Podcast Alley, and that's pretty much all I've got for the general public. I have a couple things for those of you who have the app. One thing that's uh, come up if you run into technical difficulties, on the bottom of the app there's a contact link. Um, and you want to press the contact link, and when you get there, you want to choose the um, uh, the field that's got report a problem. It's got an exclamation point by, uh, by it. Um, I've gotten a few that have been uh, technical issues, and there's not a lot I can do other than forward it on uh, to the uh, technical support. And me forwarding it on... Uh, ends up taking extra time. If you got a question about how to use it, contact me. If there's a technical issue, uh, that's that's something that support will want to take care of. And the sooner you get that to them, the sooner we can get it taken care of for you. Also, uh, someone had a question about how to access the bonus content. Like if I say with uh, with the last uh, three episodes of Pat Novak, I was including a. Um, a bonus episode of Dragnet. Uh, well, there's a main episode list, and we, 
you basically press the episode um, to uh, to listen to it, and then once you're in the episode, there's an extras button up in the corner, and you pr- uh, right corner of your iPod or iPhone, you press that, and then the audio is going to be there, uh, a bonus content with a play button, and that'll play the audio for you. So, well, today... Um, uh, is actually with, with the comments. It's somewhat of a Pat Novak um, m- Memorial Day. In fact, the title of one of the comments is "Rest in Peace, Pat Novak." Um, for those of you who haven't followed the show for a while, I record the episodes about eight days, um, eight days before they actually are posted. Um, so. Uh, today, as I'm recording this, this is the first Tuesday where there hasn't been an episode of Pat Novak. And uh, some comments. Um, this one says, I was born a little too late to remember them, but I'm getting much pleasure from all the old radio um, all the old radio broadcast. I have enjoyed your Dragnet podcast for some time and also got ho- a-, a-, a bit hooked on yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Box 13 with Ad- Alan Ladd. Good entertainment. I've got to say, though, Pat Novak has become one of my new favorites. The San Francisco setting endeared me as I grew up in the Bay Area, but the grittiness and the edge in Pat Novak for hire have made me anticipate the broadcast like none others. I like the way you meticulously research everything and keep them in order uh, where you can. I wish the old Perry Masons were available like this. Um, Well, thanks for the comment. Uh, Perry Mason, of course, because it was a daily show um, with kind of a soap soap erotic uh, feel to it, there's a lot of missing parts, so it's kind of hard to make that one make as much sense. But... Um, that's, that was been kind of the big thing that's haunted all the soaps. He, he also asked another thing. Did I hear somewhere you were doing Have Gun Will Travel and Gunsmoke? Um, actually, I am not. Andrew Rhines is at otrwesterns.com. Uh, anyway, great work. I hope you never quit. Uh, you and me both. Another one, uh, the rest in peace, Pat Novak. I'll have to go back and figure out which ones I missed and pick them up. Uh, and you can do that. I've got the, uh, those shows in my arc, uh, in the archives at uh, greatdetectives.net. Um, and uh, the Pat Novak page will be up all through the week that you're listening to this. And then afterwards, you just go uh, under about, choose the archive, and uh, Pat Novak for Hire will be listed there. And I think I'll, I might even get a, see if I can get a separate listing in iTunes. Uh, so that uh, so, so that people can just find a Pat Novak and don't have to uh, dig through a bunch of episodes if they want to uh, get to enjoy it. Uh, comment from Facebook. I have not um, regarding uh, Johnny Madero, Pete Sutro. I have not listened to this yet. I'm still upset that Pat Novak is done. Not Adam's fault. I will listen, but I may not like it. Um, and uh, Coleman, he says that, uh, he says, I like that you read comments in your shows. It shows that you care about what people say every time your critique. You read uh, those comments as well. I'm glad the old commercials are in the shows, and your commercials are at the beginning. You only put new commercials in for a few shows. Notice the feedback and change. You tried something new. Granted, it was not good, but uh, you always try to keep the show from getting repetitive. I like I like that. Keep trying. Your next idea may work better. Well, thanks so much. And uh, I, I forgot to mention that uh, listener poll completed 14 to 4. Um, you prefer the ads be at the beginning of the show. And so we will uh, honor that. And speaking of that, that's a nice segue. Uh, many, there are a lot of budget hosts out there, but they're old say with a lot of budget hosts, the saying, you get what you pay for seems to apply. Well, one-on-one provides great value uh, as you set up your personal or small business website, um, and uh, and it really uh, provides a solid service that you can rely on. Uh, we use one-on-one for all of our podcast uh, for all of our podcasts uh, that we can. Oh, we still have to have some on the old host just because of iTunes issues, uh, but we we continue to stream. It. Uh, gigabytes upon gigabytes of episodes without a worry because one-on-one gives us unlimited bandwidth. Uh, it is a great deal. I strongly recommend it. Go to greatdetectors.net, click on the one-on-one banner, 
Um, but we're going to get into today's episode of Let George Do It. This week's episode is called Crime Murder. We will listen to it, and then we'll come back. Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger is my stock and trade. If it's so far over your head you can't even reach it with a sky hook, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Valentine, here's a laugh. A private dick falling for that screwy head of yours. The name is Joe Logan. We ran across each other a couple of times, but that's not important. Here's the deal. I'm meeting somebody at the Half Moon Motel tonight. I'm not the sensitive type, but something about this ring's phony. So if you read about me in the obituary column tomorrow, I want you to cry murder good and loud. And close with a hundred bucks for your trouble. A hundred bucks for your trouble. But if you hear my sweet gravel voice over the phone before noon tomorrow, forget the whole thing and buy yourself a drink. <laughs> Sign Joe Logan. Uh-uh, I'm not buying that, Angel. It's too pat. Joe Logan knocked off by a hit-and-run driver last night of all nights. Yeah, but don't forget it says here that Mr. Logan had his customary snoopful when he was clipped by that car on a deserted stretch of Whitman Highway. And not too far away from the Half Moon Motel. Better put your ear stoppers in, Brooksy. Huh? Yeah. I'm going to cry bloody murder the way my client wanted it. Good and loud. <laughs> Look, Valentine, I don't want to be antisocial, but the only thing I've got eyes for this morning is a report just sent in. Frank Potter, prominent banker and philanthropist, was murdered. How about one Joseph Logan? I think he was murdered, too. You think, but this I know. Frank Potter was murdered, and he happened to be a close friend of the police commissioner. Oh. Yes, sir, and the commissioner doesn't like his friends being bumped off unless I can produce the miscreant five minutes later. So call me tomorrow. Oh, that's a fine attitude, Lieutenant. The only safe way to get murdered in this town is to be a friend of the commissioner's. Oh, now look, Miss Brooks, why don't we talk this over on my day off when I can afford to be a gentleman, huh? Right now, I want... Ah, now. Yes, Riley. Huh? Okay, I'm on my way out there now. What's that? What's the name of that place? Go on, go on, I'm listening. And you say this Mrs. Cronin identified the man she saw with Potter? Okay, Sergeant. Okay, I'm as good as there right now. Well, Brooksy, I guess they're too busy for us today. Yeah. Here, we'll uh, be back, Lieutenant, when this storm is over. Uh, no, you don't, Valentine. You're not leaving here. Well, what's the matter with you anyway? Do you know where Frank Potter was murdered? Look, I'm not my usual psychic self this morning. Where? The Half Moon Motel. George! Go on, Lieutenant. Yes, the Half Moon Motel, and a dame out there, a Mrs. Cronin, identified your client, Joe Logan, as the man who did the killing. I'm surprised, Mr. Valentine. The police didn't get around to me yet. Any time now, Maggie. They know that in a racket like Logan's, the secretary knows more about a boss than anybody else in the world. Maggie, don't you have any idea what Mr. Logan might have been afraid of last night? I just know that Joe's death was no accident. I I didn't even know he wrote that note. Not that it matters to Logan now, but that letter to me puts him right there in the half-moon motel with Potter. Why does it? Joe had other clients. Whenever he didn't want to meet somebody here at the office, he'd call up the half-moon motel. I know the police would love to pin this on Joe, but I'm not going to let them out. I'll cut it, Maggie. Let me have that. Hmm? What? Yeah, that page from the appointment pad. You're too nervous for any sleight of hand today. Uh, Eight o'clock. Frank Potter. Half moon. Oh, so you knew he was going to meet Mr. Potter, didn't you? All right, I did. But Joe didn't kill anybody. All right, maybe I believe it. But that's not good enough, Maggie. I've got to make sure. Now, what about the deal your boss had with Potter? I uh, don't know anything about it. Oh, you don't, huh? Okay, come on, Brooksy. We're wasting our time. Wait. You want to play this hand face up with me? It's the truth. I don't know what Potter wanted with Joe. Or perhaps what Joe wanted with Potter. Whichever way it was, but they did have a quarrel right here in the office yesterday morning. That just makes the case stronger against Logan. I couldn't hear what they were fighting about. Finally, Potter slammed out of here in a rage. I see. Just one more point, point. let's face it. 
The medical examiner reported that Joe was a little more than slightly crocked when that car sideswiped him. Joe never drank so much he didn't know what he was doing. Just the same. How about a list of his favorite bars? It might help if I knew where he was before he went to meet Potter. Joe's favorite bars? How do you want them, from A to Z? Oh, George, can't you see she's all upset? Could have been Johnny's place near City Hall or Chris's on West Laredo Street or, or it could have been the... Mort's Paddock Bar on Whitman Highway? What's that, Brooksy? Look at this book of matches in the ashtray. Mort's Paddock Bar, where good sports meet. Yes, that's another place Joe used to like to sit and talk to Mort. Whitman Highway, that's on the way to that motel. And Mr. Logan was run down on Whitman Highway. Yeah. See you later, Maggie. <laughs> Well, Mr. Valentine, should I be fall price? Oh, by all means, Mort. If it was anybody else, Mr. Logan, uh, I uh, would have said he was uh, well under the influence when he left my place last night. But uh, seeing it was, Mr. Logan, uh, what would you say? Well, you see, he's one of those good-looking strapping men who will, uh, you know, just get convivial, so to speak. Well, that's a nice way of putting it, Mort. You know something, miss? Mr. Logan's going to leave an empty place at my bar. You know, he was a swell talker. I picked up a lot of new words from him. Yes, I guess you'd say Mr. Logan was epigrammatic when it came to, uh, uh, repartee. <laughs> the poor fella. Yeah, I see what you're trying to say. But, uh, tell me, Mort, uh, what time did he leave here last night? Oh, about eight, I'd say. Before or after eight? Well, couldn't be sure, but he did say he was leaving his car in my parking lot till he got back. Well, didn't he say where he was going? No, miss, but it must have been near here because he said he was going to walk it. Ironical, isn't it? Just this time, when he decides not to use his car, he meets up with a pedestrian's face. Not just ironical, Mort. It's more than that. Yeah, now, you see right out that window? Down the highway a couple of hundred feet? That's where it all happened, on oh. the right-hand side there. Just by that first telephone pole. The oh, poor fella. Okay, thanks a lot, Mort. You've been a great help. I'm afraid I didn't have very much to say. But you did, believe me. Well, drop it again. Always nice to talk to people. Well, darling, do I ask questions, or are you going to let me in on the brainstorm? Take another look down the highway, Brooksy. What do you see? A pretty highway. Credit to the state. One lane going east, the other going west. An island of trees in the middle. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yourself. I see what you mean. Yeah. Joe Logan left the panic bar and started to walk down the highway on the right-hand side, walking toward the Half Moon Motel, not away from it. Well, if you're right, George, Logan never even got there to kill Potter. Which should simplify things for us, but doesn't. I've got a hunch you ever killed Potter ran Logan down. Yeah. Well, what next? Well, I understand there's a Mrs. Potter. Have a talk with her, Brooksy, huh? See if she knows what business her husband had with Logan. Okay, where'll I meet you? Back at the office. In the meantime, I'm going to scrape up an acquaintance with this Mrs. Cronin, who swears she saw Logan at the Half Moon Motel. <laughs> Look, Bob, since you ain't a dick, beat it. I got business with Mrs. Cronin. So have I, goon boy. I said beat it. Now, boys, remember, I do have neighbors. You leave this to me, Sheila. Are you getting out of this doorway, or do I have to step over you? Look, you do as I told you. So I step over you. You know how to make an impressive entrance, don't you? I don't think I'm forgetting this, mister. If you do, I'll be glad to refresh your memory. Oh, you shouldn't have done that to Charlie. Uh. After all, he's just a bookie trying to squeeze out a living. Well, from all these raising forms around, you seem to be one of his best customers. And I owe him $3,000 just for yesterday. And Charlie's getting a little impatient. You don't have $3,000 on you, have you? Just a few pennies shy. Uh, now, Mrs. Cronin... If you were to call me Sheila, what would I have to call you? <laughs> well, that depends on your vocabulary. After I called you a liar. I liked you the moment you came in. Can I get you a drink? You didn't see Joe Logan here last night, did you? Strange how it happened. I just looked out the window, and there he was in that cabin across the court. How come you knew Logan at all? What did you ever have to do with him? I needed a private detective one. Someone told me about Joe. What kind of a deal was it? Strictly confidential. Had nothing to do with this. The police let it go at that. Why don't you relax? You're still lying, Sheila. Whatever you say, George. No one who could afford to lose three grand a day at Jungle Up at a cheap motel like this. Oh, you're so understanding, dear. But why don't you forget it? It'd be easier if I knew how come you were here so conveniently to identify Logan. That was just an accident. I'm supposed to be with a girlfriend in Seattle. That's what my husband thinks. Oh? I gamble too much. 
Just like other people do other things too much. Once in a while, I take a room like this and splurge. Bet on anything. Bet all the time. The bigger the odds against me, the better. It's in my blood. It's, it's like a disease. Must be an expensive disease. <laughs> Poor darling. I talk too much, don't I? I want you to make me forget that I never win. I bet you can do that. What odds do you want? Oh, that's, uh, that's very nice, Sheila. But not good enough. What better odds do you want, you? Oh, thanks. Now that you've cleared the air, we can get back to business. Oh, oh George, I, I'm so sorry. Did I hurt you? What time did you tell Lieutenant Riley that you saw Logan? Eight o'clock. How come you're so sure? Well, Charlie just phoned to give me the result of the last dog race in Miami. I happen to notice the time. You're not still angry with me? You want to bet? Y you're not leaving. Sorry, Sheila. I expect to be a very busy boy. Oh, George. First a phony accident, then a number. A murder. And now you. Yes? You going all out to make me stop wondering if you frame Logan. And somehow I think it all ties together. Now all I got to do is prove it. <laughs> We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about a very important matter of motoring. If your car's battery has been acting like a mule, temperamental and balky, here's an easy way to cure it. Have your battery serviced at a standard station or independent Chevron gas station. They'll inspect the water level, cables, terminal clamps, and test the battery's condition. And they'll be frank. If it just needs a charge, they'll tell you. If your battery's really on its last legs, they'll explain how a new Atlas battery can save you money. Every Atlas battery has its certified power capacity stamped on the case where you can read it. And you'll find these capacities meet or exceed standards set by the Society of Automotive Engineers. The longer-lasting starting power of Atlas batteries, by the way, is backed by a written warranty honored everywhere by 38,000 Atlas dealers. Independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations are glad to service your battery, proud to offer you an Atlas battery when you need one. That's why they say, and mean, we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure, George Valentine. A private detective of all people mails you $100 and tells you to cry murder if he's among the missing tomorrow morning. Sure enough, the gentleman, one Joe Logan, is run down by a car during the night. Then a prominent banker is found dead in a cheap motel. And an incredible blonde who prides herself on betting on anything puts the finger on your dead client as the murderer. All of which makes you decide to ask Joe Logan's secretary a few more important questions. Come on, Maggie, think. What truck did Logan have with Sheila Cronin? Well, it was just a routine case, Mr. Valentine. It was more than a year ago. Nothing involving that hot tip addict could be routine. She's too far out of this world. Now, let's have the facts. Well? I suppose he did go out with her a couple of times. She kept after him. Was it serious enough to make Sheila feel she was the woman scorned? Make her want to frame Logan? Joe could never be serious about any woman. There were too many of them. All right, so he was a Casanova. What about the case? The insurance company hired Joe to investigate Mrs. Cronin when some of her jewels were stolen. Everything proved to be on the up and up. Joe was only on the case a couple of days. Uh, that doesn't give me much. That hot-eyed blonde is the key to this fancy frame-up. But why? That's what i got to find out. You uh, wanted to know about Mrs. Potter. Yeah? Uh, Joe never had her for a client. I even looked through all his personal papers. Which also gets us nowhere. Unless Brooksy comes up with something on Mrs. Potter. Miss Brooks, can't you see I'm dressing to go out? Oh, I just thought, Mrs. Potter, that since your husband had some dealings with Joe Logan, you might know something about him. I told you. I never heard of Joe Logan. Anyway, what right have you to question me like this? I just thought you might be interested. If it might help solve Mr. Potter's murder. I'm sure the police are doing all they can about it. Well, you might make it easier for them if you tell them all you know about Logan. What makes you so sure I know this? This Joe Logan. He was killed, you know. Well, that's just too bad. But he's not the first man to be knocked down by a hit-and-run driver. Now, get out. Oh, then you did know Joe Logan. What? Well, that's pretty obvious. 
There were only a few lines in the paper about his hit-and-run accident. Not the sort of thing you'd remember about a stranger. You know, Miss Brooks, I should have obeyed my first impulse and had the butler throw you out. <laughs> All right. I hired Joe Logan once. Why didn't you tell that to the police when they questioned? It has no bearing on this case. Does that satisfy you, Miss Brooks? Oh, not quite, but it's a good beginning. Well, I won't keep you any longer. I know you're anxious to get out and celebrate. What did you say? Get out of here. Go on, get out. Good work, Angel. I don't know what it means, but Mrs. Potter must have a good reason for denying that she knew Logan. Well, it's hard to know what she's thinking. Vivian's a cold dish with a memorized smile. Our friend Logan seems to have gone in for females who insist on being characters. Mm. Anyway, why can't we find any record of this deal with Mrs. Potter? Maybe it's uh, something you just don't put down on paper, huh? Could be, Brooksy. Well, all we know up till now is that Potter and Logan had a quarrel. Yeah, and that's both right. Both Sheila and Vivian were Logan's clients at one time or another. Oh, make something out of that if you can. Okay, Valentine. Said you want to see me? Well, Charlie, you're a good sport. I didn't think you'd show. Uh, the information you asked for over the phone, Valentine, I got it. Well. But how does it get me the three grand Sheila Cronin owes me? Look, Charlie, I'm not guaranteeing anything. But you'll stand a better chance of collecting if you play along with me. Well, I Business know. is business, Charlie. Okay. I don't know why it's so important, but it was 9 o'clock when I called Sheila about the last dog race in Miami. Sure it wasn't 8? Couldn't be. Races ain't over till almost nine. Now we know Sheila was lying. Yeah, but why? And what answers have we got if she just says I made a mistake? Yeah, now look, chum, about the three grand. Talk I'd... to you later, Charlie. Right now I gotta get over to that paddock bar and see what use I can make of Mort Fisher's garrulity. There's what? Don't look shocked, Charlie. That just means love of conversation. <laughs> It's sure good to see you, Mr. Valentine. You know, I was hoping you'd drop in. How are you, miss? Hi, Mort. Say, look, you like to talk, Mort. I thought if we sort of sat around a while, you might remember something Logan said last night that could help us. Why didn't you tell me this morning that the police think Mr. Logan bumped off this Potter guy? Then, ironically, like, mean up with an accident. Oh, you found out, huh? Oh, sure. Why, it's in the evening papers, miss. And piling irony on irony. Yeah? Look what happens to here right here in my own bar tonight. Did you ever see anything so, well, uh, fortu, uh, fortuitous, you know? Uh, you know, uh, you, well, look, you know who's sitting down there in the number one booth all by herself? No, who, Mort? Why, Porter's young wife, drowning her sorrows with champagne cocktails. Except she doesn't look too unhappy, if you ask me. Then you know Mrs. Potter. Ah, uh, that's more of the irony, miss. She used to come in here with, uh, Mr. Logan. Oh, hey, now we're getting somewhere. But that's not all. Two minutes after she comes in, that good-looking blonde from the Half Moon shows up. You know, the one who identified Mr. Logan, recognized her from the pictures in the paper. You run a popular bar here, Mort. Oh, just thanks. But it's uh, mostly, of course, the location. Last bar on the highway for the next five miles. Don't be so modest, Mort. Say, would you mind keeping Miss Brooks entertained? Hey, but wait, I have got something else to tell you. I'll be right back, Mort. Hello, Sheila. Well, look at you. Now, George, I was just getting lonely. No, thanks. What I've got to say won't take that long. Besides, you got to make another stop. Do you want to bet I can make it more interesting? Why did you lie about Logan? You never saw him at the Half Moon Motel. He never reached there. I like my story better. The dog race is not over in Florida till nine. So I made a mistake. Why did you lie? Did somebody make you do it? I'm getting fed up with this place. Let's go somewhere else, George. Or did you frame Logan because he had something on you? Was that jewelry hold up a fake with Logan playing both ends against the middle? What are you talking about? I mean, get the insurance money and sell your jewels. So you could pay off characters like Charlie the Bookie. <laughs> you know something? I'm betting you could never prove that. <laughs> hey, where are you going? Tell me, Mrs. Potter, what kind of a job did you hire Logan to do for you? I made one slip today with your secretary. That's par for the court. Your husband was some 30 years older than you. You stood a lot to gain by his death. Go on, you're doing the talking. If Logan had anything to do with it, you'd want him out of the way, too, wouldn't you? 
sorry, Mr. Valentine, but you bore me. Good night. <laughs> Well, what'd you find out, George? Tell you later, Brooksy. Hey, you didn't let me finish before, Mr. Valentine. What's that, Mort? You know, talking about quirks of fate, last night about a half hour before he left, I was right here at the bar, you know, with Mr. Logan. So you said. And who should come in from, for the short, quick, you know, but Mr. Potter. Now, I know it was infamous pictures. Did you hear what they talked about? Oh, they didn't so much as converse. I don't think Mr. Logan even knew the guy. Oh, you must be wrong, Mort. Oh, you could be very right, which is something I want to talk to Riley about. Now, let's see if we can nail him before he leaves the Half Moon Motel. Why didn't we take the car, George? Well, it's just a short walk, Angel. Yeah. Anyway, I have to have time to think. Try and make some sense out of this thing. So it doesn't sound too fantastic to Lieutenant Riley. Mm. Better keep to the side of the road, darling. Yeah. Brooksy... When we get to the motel, call Maggie at home. Yes, George? Tell her to meet us at Logan's office. There's just one thing I want to clear up. Then I think we'll have this thing late. George! Look out that car! Get out of the driver! Ah! Hey, you all right, Angel? Oh, so this is what gravel tastes like. And that car was trying to run us down, the same thing that happened to Logan. Yeah, and almost in the same place. A baby blue convertible, a big one. Hey, I noticed that before. Parked on the lot next to the paddock bar. And that's where we're going right now. Tell me something, Mort. Hey, yeah, Mr. Valentine. In the short time I was away, did you notice whether Mrs. Potter or Mrs. Cronin left your place? I can't say with any exactitude, Mr. Valentine. Oh. But it seems I do remember both ladies being up and moving around. Of course, we're crowding up now, and... Go ahead, George. Lieutenant Riley's going to stop by here and pick up the two, uh, ladies. And I left that message for Maggie to be over at Logan's office. And that baby blue convertible of Mrs. Potter's is still in the parking lot. Good, good. Now, if we don't find out what really happened, we never will. Okay, Valentine, what's your story? The one we got says uh, Logan killed Potter, and the commissioner likes that version, too. Just a minute, Lieutenant. Oh, Brooksy. Hmm? Call into the outer office and see if Maggie's ready to take all this down. Okay, George. So you think this is a photo finish between me and Mrs. Potter? Is that it, George, dear? Lieutenant Riley, I've answered this man's questions all day. Do I have to go through this now? If you don't mind, Mrs. Potter, yes. You ready, Maggie? Yes, Miss Brooks. Okay, go ahead, George. Okay. Okay, Riley, here's the way I see it. Joe Logan makes a deal with a woman who always needs money because she bets too much. Cooks up a deal with her to cheat the insurance company, then blackmails her. But I didn't kill him. Logan also talks to a pretty young matron, much younger than her husband. So you think I'm pretty? Thank you, Mr. Valentine. She wants Logan to help her get rid of her husband without involving her, and so she can still get a big chunk of his money. I discussed that with Logan. That's as far as it went. Uh, keep going, Valentine. Well, a wonderful plan is born, Lieutenant. Somebody makes an appointment for Logan to meet Potter at the Half Moon Motel. When Potter arrives, he's murdered. Then Logan is deliberately run down on the road. And you know, Lieutenant, dead men tell no tale. Yes, that much we know. Yes, do get to the point, George. Then enters what Mort would call the ironical touch. We're told that Logan and Potter had a violent quarrel the very day of the murder. Who should know better than the secretary who overheard it? Is that right, Maggie? That's right, Mr. Valentine. Then Mr. Potter does a very human thing. On the way to his appointment, which he knows he has to do with his wife, he stops in for a quick drink at Mort's bar. He stands almost next to Logan, but they don't say a word to each other. Because they've never met before. Ah, uh, look, look, you've got to make more sense than this, Valentine, because uh, I don't get it. Oh, you'll get this, Lieutenant. Why were we told there was a quarrel? Because that would supply the motive for Logan to kill Potter. And who'd know enough about Sheila to force her to place Logan at the motel when he wasn't there at all? A lot of questions, Mr. Valentine. How about some answers? Coming to that, Mrs. Potter, coming to that. But just one final question. If Logan were proved as your husband's murderer, who would be in the position to hold you up for the rest of your life? 
What? Someone who had the proof that you were dickering with Logan. Maybe you weren't talking murder, but it might sound like it. Getting all this down, Maggie? You got that proof, haven't you? That's why you committed two murders. Maggie! What? Didn't what? you, Maggie? Yes. You've got your facts all straight, Mr. Valentine. They make a wonderful confession. I may as well sign it now. One more proof, Mr. Valentine, about life being ironical. What's that, boy? Oh, George, I don't know if I can stand much more irony in one case. Well, just after you left, I mean, after you asked me about Mrs. Potter and Mrs. Cronin, I checked with the waiters. And? They said neither one of the ladies left the place at all. And there you were, suspecting the both of them. Well, that's all cleared up now. Yeah, there was another lady who borrowed Mrs. Potter's car, Mort. She tried to run us down. We were getting a little too close to the truth for her comfort. Hey, you know, folks, we've been through a whole lot together. Say, uh, how about dinner tonight with me, you know, on the house? Hey, how about that, Brooksy? Oh, I think that would be perfectly ironic. Good, good. Maybe we can stir up some exciting conversation. Uh, it gets uh, awfully dull around this place sometimes. Dull? Oh, Mort, you can't mean that. So help me, Miss Brooks. I don't know why you're giving me that look of quizzicality. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be willing to bet there's not one car owner in a thousand who could lubricate his car thoroughly. For there are more than 20 vital wear points on the average car, and if most of us tried to find them, it would be pure guesswork. Even the expert lube men at the independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations don't rely on experience alone when they grease your car. Instead, they follow a precise lubrication chart recommended by the manufacturer of your car. And they use RPM greases and oils, each one tailor-made to protect those key wear points. Tailor-made, too, to smooth out road shocks and give you easier riding. So for low-cost maintenance and better riding, get a lube job with RPM greases every thousand miles. Get it at a standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear Lieutenant Riley saying... Now, Valentine, uh, you say your client was held up Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. Uh-huh. Well, uh, according to this report, the only crimes that took place in our fair city on Tuesday night were uh, a pickpocket apprehended at 7th and Duncan, and... What's the matter, Lieutenant? Uh, I should have remembered myself. The Hafey murder... Killer still at large. Victim previously married to... Here. Here, Valentine, you can have the honor. You've earned it. This adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Gloria Blondell as Sheila Cronin, Virginia Gregg as Vivian Potter, Betty Lou Gerson as Mickey. Dick Ryan as Mort, and Tony Barrett as Charlie. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.
Welcome back. If there was one scene that made it made this episode uh, that uh, just absolutely stood out to me, it was after um, Valentine had the fist the fist fight, beat the guy up, and the guy screamed, "I won't forget this!" And Valentine shot uh, shot back, "If you do, I'll be glad to refresh your memory." Uh, classic, because it's one of those absolutely cliched uh, remarks. And when you hear somebody uh, from uh, from the guy who got beat up, um, and when you hear some uh, a, a a really clever response to it, you gotta say, "Good job on that." Got a comment on the blog from Lane. So glad I found you. Uh, regard this was regarding let George do it. Bailey was amazing in this role, and the show is timeless. Definitely agree. Uh, particularly when you get better sound quality, you can't even tell uh, it, a, a lot of times that uh, this is uh, old. Got a couple other quick comments off Podcast Alley. Uh, thanks, Adam, for interesting shows with informative and entertaining commentary, and that's from. Andrew Via in uh, Richmond, that actually came in since I started recording, so, uh, uh, and here's a, here's a last, uh, last podcast alley comment from Niffer Nurse, keep up the good work, I love the show, and then I've got one, uh, I've got one on Facebook from April who writes, every afternoon you motivate me to clean the house, I listen to several episodes of your podcast, keep it, uh, keep it up, my house will get pretty messy if you don't. Well, there you go. I mean, the sh- we've heard about the show inspiring family togetherness. Now it's inspiring cleanliness. Though, if I told my parents they were, uh, I was inspiring cleanliness, cleanliness, they were one. They'd wonder why I wasn't inspired growing up. But <laughs> all right. Well, seriously, thanks for the comments. Well, another uh, couple comments on uh, Pat Novak for hire. Um, uh, um, one Melissa comments she's gonna miss the ho- foghorns too, and Jocko's word, uh, Jocko's words of wisdom. The Jocko, I don't think there's any match for. Uh, there was actually another detective series that opened up with uh, foghorn. He, actually, right until you actually hear the narration, it sounds very similar to Pat Novak. Uh, then it goes completely the different direction. It's uh, a show named Bulldog Drummond. Uh, I don't know whether we're going to run that or not. Um, uh, I'm still making up my mind on that one. But that's where you can go for a, a foghorn. But I, I'm really glad people enjoyed the series. I think it was a great uh, show to lead off on Tuesday. So, all right. Well, we're going to get start. Oh, uh, and I also did want to acknowledge, I got a couple comments from the early shows um, pointing out um uh pointing out the uh errors in the first two shows i've already noted those before um and one i i noted on the um um i i actually went ahead and noted on the um uh show notes so we got that taken care of well we're going to get into sherlock holmes in just a second before we get started with uh, today's show i want to i encourage you uh, if you're a fan of uh, Sherlock Holmes, the ITV version that was shown on uh, PBS and would like to recapture that on your own TV anytime you'd like, uh, then I've got a recommendation for you. Uh, get a Roku. On Roku, um, you uh, if you have a Netflix account, you can watch uh, Jeremy Brett's, Brett's uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, through Instant Watch right to your television. Um, and you can watch him in uh, The Last Vampire, The Sign of Four, The Hound of the Baskervilles, The Eligible Bla- uh, Bachelor, The Master Blackmailer, uh, as well as The Adventure of Sherlock Holmes and The Return of Sherlock Holmes. All these great Jeremy Brett uh, shows are available uh, cur- uh, currently uh, using the Instant Watch and your Roku player to come right to your TV. So go to roku.greatdetectors.net or click the Roku link on the website. Well, we're going to get into today's episode of Sherlock Holmes, the Purloin Ruby. Uh, we'll go ahead and listen, and then we'll come back. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... 
Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petrie family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective Sherlock Holmes. I suppose your dinner is well over by now, so now's the perfect time to get out a bottle of that swell Petri California port. You know, Petri port's just made for a time like this, after dinner when you're just taking things easy. If you've ever tasted Petri port, you know what I mean. It's a hearty, full-bodied wine with a deep red color and a flavor that's just about out of this world. I think that if you had only one wine to choose and the whole world to choose from, chances are you'd pick port. Petri port. That's how good I think it is. That's saying plenty, I know, but I think Petri port will easily live up to all I say about it. Try it and see. And share it with your friends. You can serve Petri port proudly because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wine. And now let's visit our old friend, Dr. Watson. I'm up here on the patio, Mr. Foreman. Come on out and join me. Admiring the sunset, eh, Doctor? Yes, my boy. It's a particularly beautiful one. Where are the puppies this evening? Uh, asleep on a, a favorite tweed coat of mine that's just come back from the cleaning. <laughs> and you hadn't the heart to move them, I suppose. No, no, I hadn't. The little fellows looked so comfortable. In fact, I sometimes wonder if these... Uh, that you haven't come here to, to listen to a dissertation on the behavior of dogs? Well, it is getting near story time, Doctor. Yes, of course it is. Well, just let me... Uh, Get my pipe properly lighted. Ah, that's it. The story I'm going to tell you tonight began in 1909. I received a telegram from my old friend telling me that he was leaving his Sussex bee farm and coming to London for a few days. I hadn't seen the great man for several months, so naturally I went to Victoria Station to meet him. As the train drew to a stop, the door of a first-class carriage swung open and Sherlock Holmes... Hand outstretched, jump down onto the platform to greet me. What, my dear fellow, how are you? Oh, oh, my dear fellow, it's good to see you again. I've missed you. And are you, old chap? Can you bank, sir? Uh, yes, Porter, and get a handsome cab, will you? Right, you all, Governor. I wish I'd got a spare room for you. Don't worry, Watson, I shall be very comfortable at the Diogenes Club. By the way, I trust you're free this evening. Yes, naturally. What are your plans? I thought we'd go to the theatre. The theatre? Oh, what play do you want to see? Well, I thought we'd go to the Savoy Theatre and see the Sherlock Holmes play. I hear it's enormously successful. Yes, I know it is, but I've avoided it. I'm told that Sir Claude Horton takes great liberties with your character, and as for the actor portraying me, my friends tell me it's a, it's a travesty. He makes me nothing but a uh, bumbling old fool. <laughs> Therefore, a visit to the play might be a salutary experience for both of us. In any case, my trip to London is a response to an urgent telegram from Sir Claude himself. Seems to need my help rather badly. Oh, what's his problem? <clears throat> well, he wasn't specific in his telegram. He suggested, however, that we attend tonight's performance and discuss the matter with him afterwards. I see. Well, I, I suppose if you can sit through it, I can. Oh, of course you can, old fellow. In any case, you yourself are partly responsible for the play's existence. How do you mean, Holm? Oh, <laughs> those sensational stories you wrote of my modest problems, I... I should have seen where they would eventually lead you. In time, no doubt, this will uh, be portrayed on the cinematograph as well. Nonsense, Holmes. That newfangled thing's only a toy. I think not, Watson. We're on the edge of a strange new mechanical world. In fact, I begin to feel a certain concern about the rumored developments in wireless telegraphy. But enough of these predictions. Here comes our porter with a cab. We'll tell the driver to take us straight to the Savoy Theatre. <laughs> Just look at that line of people at the at the uh, box office, home. Very flapping, old chap. Well, possibly, but I hope it doesn't mean that we've got to wait our turn. And... Oh. Excuse me, gentlemen. You're Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, aren't you? Yes, yes. I yes. thought I couldn't be mistaken. My name is Frank Ferrer. How do you do, Mr. Ferrer? I'm glad to meet you. The Claude has a box reserved for you. He asked me to see that you are quite comfortable. They consider it on him. Will you follow me, please? Thank you. Um, neither of you have seen the play before, I understand. Uh, no, Mr. Ferrer, we haven't. <laughs> I imagine it'll be a strange experience seeing yourselves portrayed on the stage. 
By the way, uh, I'm playing the part of an old friend of yours, Professor Moriarty. Oh, indeed. I'm <laughs> looking forward to a very entertaining evening. I presume that you escape our clutches, as usual? <laughs> yes, I do, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> and I've done it nightly now for 137 performances. Oh, a record that I'm sure Professor, uh, Professor Moriarty himself would envy. Had it not been for his memorable demise at the Reichenbach Falls... Ah, here we are, gentlemen. This is the box reserved for you. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'll go back to my dressing room. Oh, oh, I nearly forgot, Mr. Holmes. Sir Claude asked me to give you this note. Thank you. No, not at all. Well, I'll see you later. <laughs> Very nice fellow, for an actor. Don't be a snob, Watson. Well, what does the Claude note say? I'll read it to you. Dear Holmes, since I telegraphed you yesterday, there have been strange developments. In fact, I've been doing some detective work off stage as well as on. Watch the performance tonight and watch the audience too, particularly the occupant of the box opposite yours. Please come to my dressing room as soon as the last curtain has fallen. Oh, he's being very mysterious and the box opposite ours is empty. No, no, no. Look, Watson, look. Someone has just entered. Confound it, the house lights are going out. The first act's beginning, Holmes. The first act, yes. Well, sit back and relax, old fellow. Let's see what they've done to us. Well, what did you think of the first act, Holmes? Huh? Oh, the first act, yes, yes. I was um, examining the occupant of the box opposite ours. An attractive young lady. Alone and unusually preoccupied in her program. In fact, one might assume that she was trying to hide her face. Yes, but the play, don't you think it's ridiculous? Just imagine a crown jewel being stolen from the Tower of London. Why not? It's been attempted many times. Anyhow, you must admit that the actor who's portraying me behaves like a, like a blithering idiot. <laughs> and Sir Claude's interpretation of you is uh, pretty far-fetched. Far-fetched, but flattering, Watson. A poise, what suavity, and what a voice. I find myself fully entertained. You're a strange chap, Holmes. No accounting for your tastes. Look, Watson, look. The back of the box over there. Good Lord, I could have sworn a man dodged behind the curtain. I don't think the girl saw him, though. Looked like a foreigner. <laughs> I think as the young lady's alone, we'll take the liberty of joining her. Oh, dash it, there go the lights again. The second act starting now. And sit down, old fellow. We don't want to attract attention. We'll join her during the next intermission. <laughs> you want with me? Uh, my name is Sherlock Holmes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. Uh, how do you do, young lady? I hope you'll forgive this intrusion, but Sir Claude requested that I keep an eye on you during the play tonight. Please come in and sit down, won't you? Thank you. Oh, this is very kind of you. You must forgive my abruptness just now, but I've just been watching Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson being impersonated on the stage. It's, it's rather startling to have the real couple walk into my box. <laughs> yes, I quite understand. By the way, just before the curtain went up on the second act, I thought I noticed a man come into the back of this box and disappear again. Were you aware of his presence? No. No, I didn't see him. But I know who it is. He's been following me for weeks now. Perhaps you'd like to tell us about it, Miss... Uh... Miss Henshaw. Alicia Henshaw. Yes, I would. As a matter of fact, that's why I'm here tonight. Sir Claude Horton's an old friend of my father's. I went to ask his advice. He did some investigating himself for a few days, and then he found himself a little out of his depth, so he decided to telegraph for you, Mr. Holmes. We were going to meet in his dressing room after the performance tonight. Splendid. And now, Miss Henshaw, what is your story? It's a strange one, Mr. Holmes, though I didn't realize just how strange until I first saw this play a few nights ago. You see, my story concerns a stolen ruby. Good Lord, and tonight's play revolves around the same thing. Exactly. I might as well tell you how it all started. My brother's an officer in the British Army stationed in Egypt. Early this year, he saved the life of a very important native personage in some uprising in Cairo and was rewarded with a magnificent ruby. This jewel he sent to my Uncle Timothy and me. Oh, we're the last of the Henshaws, you see. Did your brother tell you the name of this personage? He didn't know it, Mr. Holmes. Apparently, the whole affair was hushed up. I see. Please continue. Well, the trouble began shortly after Uncle Timothy and I received the ruby. A description of it was published in the papers, and a few days later, a message came to us from Egyptian, Mohammed Ali laying claim to the stone as one stolen from his family years ago. He sent an expert to our house who examined the ruby under a lens, Mr. Holmes, and then tapped it with a hammer. It fell to pieces. 
it was a fraud. Oh, gracious me, an amazing thing. I'm sure that's not the end of the story, Miss Henshaw. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. I wrote and told my brother what had happened. He became very suspicious and suggested that I investigate the credentials of the expert that examined the stone. I think I can finish the story for you. The supposed expert was a jewel thief who substituted a paste ruby for the real one. Destroyed the imitation and walked off with the treasure. It's no trick. Of course, you haven't been able to find any trace of the supposed expert. Well, that's the funny part of it, Mr. Holmes. Uncle Timothy and I gave a description to the police, but oh, it was a very vague one, I'm afraid. All the time, Uncle said the man reminded him of a colleague of his many years ago at the university, a professor of mathematics. He couldn't think of his name, but when we first saw the play a few nights ago, he was reminded of it. The name was Moriarty. Moriarty? But... Moriarty's dead. Miss Henshaw, you say you uh, have been shadowed for some weeks. Yes, an Egyptian. You've stolen the ruby, Mr. Holmes. Why don't they leave me alone? That, Miss Henshaw, represents a, a very fascinating problem and one that I shall be most happy to help you solve. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Holmes. Oh, there go the lights again. The last act. Yes, the last act of this little play, but not, I fear, of Miss Henshaw's problems. Uh, let's meet after the act in Sir Claude's dressing room, shall we? <laughs> Well, Holmes, how did you enjoy the play? Very much, Sir Claude. May I introduce my old friend, Dr. Watson? How do you do, Sir Claude? How are you, Doctor? I see you've already made the acquaintance of Miss Henshaw. She, no doubt, has told you her troubles, eh? Yes, Sir Claude. And Mr. Holmes has promised to help me. Splendid. Uh, tell me, Watson, how did you like the play? It was uh, very interesting, Sir Claude. Not quite accurate, of course. Well, you, you have to allow us a little dramatic license, you know. Uh, what did you think of Rodney, the man who was praying you, Doctor? Well, since you mention it, I think the fellow needs to study diction. He, he mumbles so much, I could, could understand what he said. <laughs> oh, come now, old fellow. I, I think there are times when you're a, a little hard to understand yourself. Oh, rubbish. Sir Claude, I oh, hope you'll uh, meet us at the Diogenes Club, and then we can go out and have some supper. Excellent idea. I'll join you there after I've taken off my makeup. Splendid. I think I should be going home now, Sir Claude. I gave my address to Mr. Holmes so he knows where to get in touch with me. Very well, Miss Henshaw, and don't worry. I shall give your problem my undivided attention. I'll take you to your cab, my dear. Oh, there's no need to, Sir Claude. Nonsense, I insist. Goodbye. I'll be back in a moment. Good night, Miss Henshaw. Well, good night, good night. It's a strange business, Holmes. What, what do you make of it all? Very little as yet, but it's a fascinating problem. Sir Claude really seems to uh, have identified himself with the character of Sherlock Holmes. He gave me the impression that he feels quite capable of, of solving the case by himself. Oh, hello. Claude hasn't left, has he? Oh, no, Mr. Fellows. He's coming back in a moment. Uh-huh. <clears throat> How do you like the play, gentlemen? Very much. Your own performance as Moriarty was most convincing. Yes, yes, indeed, sir. Congratulations. Congratulations. A couple of times there, I had a strange feeling that you, you really were Moriarty. Well, that's very flattering, Doctor. Oh, Hello. Well, it sounds as if there's some trouble at the stage door. Hey, excuse me. Come on, Watson, let's follow him. Right. Hello, it's Sir Claude. He seems upset about something. Yes. What's happened, Sir Claude? Oh, there you are, Holmes. I, I just seen Miss Hampshire off in her cab when a foreign-looking fellow came out of a doorway and got into another cab. I heard him tell the driver to follow her. I, I tried to stop him, but... He got away. Must be the same man that we saw in our box during the play. Mr. Claude, we have our address. I think we'll drive there at once and see that she's arrived safely. We'll join you later at the Diogenes Club. Well, Holmes, here we go. Off on another adventure. Yes, and one they may give us an opportunity of crossing swords with Moriarty once more. Oh, Moriarty's dead. He was killed when you and he fell over the precipice in 91. He was supposed to have been killed, just as I was, but his body was never found. It's impossible, or rather possible, that he returned to pour into the ears of Colonel Moran a story as unlikely and as true as the one I related to you on that April evening in 1894. One can never be sure of death, old chap, until one has touched the cold skin of a corpse. Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a few seconds. Hardly time for me to tell you about a really great Petri wine. Petri California Muscatel. Did you ever walk through a vineyard early in the morning and pick a big, juicy Muscat grape right off the vine? 
Mm -mm. If you've ever done that, then you know what to expect when you taste Petri Muscatel. Petri Muscatel is the color of golden sunshine with a flavor to match. Serve Petri Muscatel after dinner some evening, or serve it any time friends drop in. It's a wonderful way to express your hospitality with a wonderful wine, a Petri wine. And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. The famous pair have become involved in a strange mystery concerning a stolen ruby, a frightened girl, and an Egyptian who appears to be shadowing her. As we rejoin our story, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are standing in a darkened alleyway adjoining the girl's house. Holmes, Holmes, look, look, look. That Egyptian fellow. He's pacing up and down in front of the house. Yes, therefore, we may assume she's safely inside. Uh-huh. Seems to be giving up. He's, he's coming this way. Flatten yourself against the wall. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Who are you, please? We are friends of Miss Hanshaw. And we're very curious to know why you've been following her. I'm sorry that I cannot answer your question, <clears throat> sir. Now, look here, my man. You're talking to Mr. Sherlock Holmes. You are Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I'm greatly honored to meet you, sir. All my life I have known of you. All my life I have admired you. Then in that case, perhaps you'll answer my questions. Uh, why have you been following Miss Hanshaw? Because it is my duty. What do you mean, your duty? Perhaps I should have said my destiny, Mr. Holmes. For two generations now, the family of... Arabi, of which I am a humble member, have dedicated their lives to finding the stolen treasure of Asyut. What on earth has that got to do with Miss Hanshaw? Hmm? The treasure of Asyut is a giant ruby. It was stolen many years ago from the family of Muhammad Ali. A few months ago, Miss Hanshaw received a mysterious ruby. I have found out many things, Mr. Holmes. I have many sources of information. Then I must regard you in the light of a, a rival detective in this case. I hardly call myself a detective, Mr. Holmes. My life is dedicated to only one problem. Miss Hanshaw now says the jewel was stolen from her. I do not believe it. That is why I watch her. If I am wrong this time, and I do not think I am wrong, then my quest must go on. Always it will go on. Permit me to wish you the best luck, sir. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Good night, gentlemen. Oh, good night, good night. Sure, we shall meet again. Oh, why did you let him go, Holmes? Why not? He's frightening Miss Hanshaw. But not molesting her, old chap. In fact, it might be a good thing if someone is keeping an eye on her. In the meanwhile, Watson, let's see if we can find a cab and get back to the Diogenes Club. I don't want to keep Squad waiting. Squad, has the Claude Horton arrived yet? Yes, Mr. Holmes. He and another gentleman came in about five minutes ago. They went up to the library. The other gentleman has just left. I see. Thank you. This way, Watson. I'm sorry, Sir Claude, to have kept you waiting. We took a little longer, but... Sir Claude! Great heaven! What's the matter with him? Holmes! I... I... I found the answer. Too late. It's... It's... No, 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 sir. Don't try and stand up. You're... You're ill. What are you trying to tell me? The ruby. The ruby. Moriarty. The answer... The answer's... In... The book. In the book. Sir Claude! Holmes! He's been stabbed. He's dead. Just as he was trying to give me a message. He was muttering something about the ruby and Moriarty. And twice he said, it's in the book. Yes, the book's still in his hand. It's a copy of the tales of Edgar Allan Poe. His thumb's marking page. The story of the purloined letter. Thank you, Sir Claude. You delivered your message. Come on, Watson. If we want to catch a murderer and a thief, we must go back to the Savoy Theater as quickly as we can. Why do you suppose Sir Claude was murdered? Because I was too curious. I've been investigating the problem of the stolen ruby and found out something. Something he promised to tell me at supper, you remember? And so he was killed by a man who came with him to the club tonight. Fortunately, he gave me a clue by indicating Poe's story of a purloined letter. But I still don't see that how that helps you. Well, it leads us to the ruby. The premise of Poe's story is that the most obvious hiding place is the safest. Now, what uh, a physical object was most prominent on the stage in tonight's play? By Jove. Uh, a ruby. Exactly. 
How better can you hide a stolen ruby than by exhibiting it night after night as a stolen ruby before the eyes of thousands? Well, you mean you expect to find it in the in the property room backstage? Precisely. That and the murderer. Wait for us, Kay. Come on, Watson. Do you have your revolver, old chap? Yeah, yes, I do. Well, keep it handy. Our uh, visit may not be unexpected. I'm locked. That's good. Come on. Look, Holmes. Look. The doorkeeper. He's slumped over his desk. Hmm. He's been given chloroform. We'll take the liberty of borrowing his lantern. Oh, an eerie atmosphere. About a dark and empty theater in the home. Now, where would the stage properties be kept, I wonder? Hold the lantern a little higher, will you, old fellow? Yeah. That's it. Ah, look over there. A large cabinet. It's marked property department. And it's unlocked. Oh, this is frighteningly easy. Let's look out for a trap. Now, let's see. Look, look. There's a ruby lying on that press. Hold it up under the lantern, Watson. Exactly. It's as I thought. This is no paste stage property. It's a genuine ruby. In the light of this lantern, it's very hard to... Down, Watson, quick! He nearly got us. Smashed our lantern. Yes, he's got an air rifle, a powerful one, too, confront. There's no flash to indicate where he's firing from. Of course, he's baited his trap so neatly that he knows exactly where we are. I'm going to take a shot at him. I can't see anything, but at least it'll let him know we're armed. Now, move your position quickly, Watson. Just missed me, Holmes. This is hopeless shooting in the dark. Yes. I've got to switch the stage lights on. Keep him occupied, old fellow, will you? While I try to find the light switches. I've got him. But he can still shoot, confound it. Yes, well, I found the light switch. Keep your eyes skinned, Watson. I'm turning it on. There he is, Holmes. Up in that box. He's getting away. Up him, Watson. We can jump over the footlights into the box. Ah! I'm afraid the bird has flown, Watson. I should have remembered the theater exit doors always open from the inside. No, no, he didn't get away, Holmes. Look on the floor. It's that Egyptian fellow. I hope you haven't wounded him too badly, no, old I chap. I don't care if I have. He was trying to kill us. No, it's only a shoulder wound. He's fainted, infernal scoundrel. No, he's a very gallant man. Undoubtedly, he was trying to save us as you shot him just now. Holmes, what on earth are you talking about? Obviously, it's Moriarty. No, Watson, Moriarty just escaped through the door you heard clang a few moments ago. Then what's this man doing here? As a fellow detective, undoubtedly he followed us. Perhaps he preceded us. When Moriarty started shooting, this man tried to capture him and got wounded by you for pains. Then who is Moriarty? He must be someone connected with this theater. It's obvious. Moriarty is Moriarty. What? You mean Frank Ferrers, the fellow that played the part on the stage? Again, remember Poe's story of a purloined letter. But why didn't, didn't you recognize him? Oh. Remember, I haven't seen him for 20 years, and you haven't forgotten his genius for disguise, have you? What incredible audacity. How bad could Moriarty conceal himself than by announcing nightly to the theater-going public that he was Professor Moriarty? And then he killed Sir Claude. Of course he did. Sir Claude must have persuaded Moriarty to go to the club with him. Probably he hoped to expose him in front of me, but Moriarty found out that uh, Sir Claude knew too much. Yes. So he stabbed him. Rush back here to bait his trap for us. Yes, 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 yes. But, but how did he know that we'd uh, we'd walk into it? Well, he knew that if Sir Claude had guessed his secret, then I said would, and so he was waiting for us. Ah, uh, hello. He's coming too. How are you feeling, my man? The, the ruby. The ruby. Did you find the ruby? Yes. Here it is, sir. Tell me, is it the ruby of? Muhammad Ali? No. No. It is a fine stone, but it is not the one for which I have searched all my life. And so my endless quest must go on and on and on. He's fainted again. Ah, poor Paul. Thank mess I made of this case, Watson. Oh, I don't know. You recovered the ruby? Yes, look at it, old fellow. Before I turn it over to Miss Hanshaw, look at it well. Probably its every facet stands for a bloody deed. It's a beautiful stone. And yet this lovely bauble costs Sir Claude his life. And that devil Moriarty still goes free. But one day, Watson, and may the day come soon, 
I shall meet Moriarty again. And when that happens and I finally bring him to justice, then and only then, can you write Finney to the character of Sherlock Holmes? Well, Doctor, that was kind of an exciting story. Tell me, did the Egyptian recover from his bullet wound? Yes, indeed he did, and rather quickly, too, Mr. Foreman. I felt very badly about shooting him, but of course, uh, I couldn't help it. Of course not. Uh, but you know, if I had to shoot someone accidentally, I, I wish it could have been the, the actor who portrayed me on the stage. Wretched fellow mumbled all over the place. <laughs> oh, don't worry about that. After all, you did recover the ruby. Yes, and a beautiful stone it was. The color of, uh, well, uh, the color of a fine glass of port when the light shines through it. By a fine port, I think you're talking about a Petri port? Is there any other kind? <laughs> well, all kidding aside, Doctor, <laughs> Petri port, like all Petri wines, is good wine. And I can tell you why very simply. Petri took time to bring you good wine. You see, the Petri family has been making wine for a good many generations, since way back in the 1800s. And because the Petri business has always been family-owned, everything the family has ever learned about the art of making wine, they've been able to hand down from father to son. From father to son. That adds up to a lot of skill and a lot of experience when it comes to turning plump, juice-filled California grapes into clear, fragrant, delicious wine. So when you want a wine for any occasion, obviously you can't go wrong with a Petri wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And now, Dr. Watson, what story do you have lined up for us next week? Oh, now let me see. Next week, Mr. Foreman, I'm going to tell you a most unusual adventure that occurred to Sherlock Holmes and me early in the last World War. It took place in Flanders and concerned a famous British general, uh, an actress, and a German firing squad. Boy, that sounds like a real thriller. Well, see you here next week. No, no, no. Uh, not here, Mr. Foreman, remember? Oh, of course. Next week, we're going to be at the Paramount Theater in Hollywood for the 7th War Loan Drive. That's quite right. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't invite you all to my home for one of our broadcasts, but we can get together next week at the Paramount Theater in Hollywood. You can get a free ticket for our broadcast by buying a war bond. And I sincerely hope that you will do this so that we can see you next week at this time. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Second Stain. Mr. Rathbone appears to the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce to the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, Pet, Petri wine. This is Bill Foreman saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios... This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Uh, I had to... Uh, I would definitely buy a war bond to hear those guys uh, per, uh, perform the show live. And uh, again, again, another nice gesture from Sherlock Holmes. And I'm sure we're going to... Uh, the the whole cast there. I'm sure we're gonna we're gonna like next week's episode. I haven't heard it yet, but it sounds it sounds interesting. I I have to admire how Petri um, uses everything to plug its wine, including the color of the ruby, um, and just go ahead and segue that into wine. Um, I guess that's why nothing um, polka dotted is going to be stolen. 
Uh, I hope there's not polka dot wine anyway. Um, this one, you know, we got an email about a week ago where, where somebody said, you know, this show doesn't have any humor. Well, uh, and I said it was kind of dry. This was actually a pretty funny episode. Uh, I loved how Watson complained about uh, how Nigel Bruce, uh, plain Watson, complained that the guy who played him made him sound like a blithering idiot who mumbled all the time. <laughs> Uh, it was that was classic, and uh, the whole conversation there, uh, first conversation between Holmes and Watson, was an absolute hoot. So uh, some pretty good humor here. Uh, I was pr- pretty happy with this one. So we've got some more show suggestions, and I, I like these because I get to talk about some of these other shows and learn some that I might want to learn a little more about. Um, adventures. Uh, first one is. Uh, from Madeline, who says, I love this show. Are you ever going to play The Adventures of Michael Shane? Um, yes, yes, um, definitely uh, going to do that one. Uh, don't, don't know quite when. Uh, the Jeff Chandler ones are the ones that I've heard. There's also some Wally Mayer ones and uh, a few others that were made by ABC later on. I want to take a listen to uh, it's going to be a bit challenging uh, because the 26 syndicated episodes of the show have been uh, in trading. They have been titled and retitled to the point that it's going to be a bit of, ch- of a challenge to get them sorted out. Uh, but it'll definitely be well worth it. If you like Pat Novak, you'll, you will enjoy Michael Shane. Uh, it doesn't have uh, Jocko Madigan, but it's got a lot of hard-boiled action. And Jack Webb even shows up uh, in at least three episodes as a guest star, a couple times pay- playing a police officer and once playing a heavy. Um, so uh, new, uh, Adventures of Michael Shane will definitely do uh, at least the Jeff Chandler ones and probably the others, too. I, I'll take a listen to, to those before it's all said and done. Jeffrey had a few more series uh, he thought of. He mentioned uh, Richard Diamond and Nero Wolf before. He mentions Casey Crime Photographer. Um, I haven't ma- heard enough of that series to make up my mind as to um, if I, you know, want to to have it on the show for uh, for years. Um, but uh, I I've only heard one episode of that, so. I've yet to make up my mind. Sam Spade is kind of moving towards a, a probable, probably. If nothing else, it looks like popular demand is um, strong on um, is strong on that. Um, Mister and Mrs. North. I love. Uh, basically, let me get. There are two. Uh, there are two things I'll say about Mr. and Mrs. North. I absolutely love Mr. and Mrs. North, and I really don't like Mr. and Mrs. North. Um, that Now, that's confusing, but that's because there were two separate runs of the show. Um, well, there was a pilot for a third, uh, but uh, the first run I'm definitely going to do. It's the Alice Frost. Um, the Alice Frost version of, of um, and uh, Joseph Curtin version of Mr. and Mrs. North was a great uh, comedy uh, detective show. Um, and they had good comedy, good mysteries, uh, some surprising turns. Um, I, I think was a was a pretty good detective show. The Richard Denning and Barbara Britton version, that I didn't care of, uh, too much for. Um, when they... Uh, when they went with uh, Denning and Britton, they really turned the show into a bit of a into a crime melodrama, um, where you were just basically where you spent way too much time with the the um, with the killers, um, and they were just uh, you know a emo- you know emoting, and there wasn't really a point to it. <laughs> detectives there. Um, so I didn't find those as enjo- I didn't find those as enjoyable uh, those enjoyable. But the fr- uh, the the Frost and uh, Curtain version uh, that one I liked. Uh, the one I, the they did a pilot with the people who did Mr. and Mrs. North on Broadway, Carl Eastman and um, Peggy Conklin, 
Um, and it was funny in a way, except I, um, Mr. North was just horribly mad throughout the whole show. And you got the feel, you know, and most of the show, I I think the real terror of that episode, since they didn't have a mystery, was you were afraid that once everybody left, um, they were going to, Mr. North was going to beat up Mrs. North. It was just not a fun uh, listening experience. But uh, Curtin and Frost, absolutely, it's a great show. Uh, and it's one of those ones that I'll actually, if I'm like, okay, let me go ahead and don't want to record a show for air, um, just want to sit back and enjoy something fun, um, I'll pro- I will, will t- uh, that'll be one of the ones I'll definitely reach for. So, great questions. Um, I do have a new resource actually in my hands. It is the Who is Johnny Dollar Matter. It's written by John C. Abbott. Uh, and I've got to t- and uh, I've got to tell you, this guy's the ultimate Johnny Dollar fan. Uh, he he basically the way he researched this uh, is he listened to every single Johnny Dollar episode that's in existence uh, multiple times, uh, and that's uh, when, when we're coming to Johnny Dollar. That's more than seven hundred plus episodes. Uh, so really a committed fan, and uh, also for those shows to where he did not. Um, where where the episodes were not in existence, there's a library in Thousand Oaks, California, has a lot of old-time radio scripts. And he went in there, read the scripts, and wrote summar- summarizations of them. So some incredible uh, research went into this. Um, he's got some general summaries of uh, Johnny Dollar, like what his uh, personal life was, uh, family, uh, things that he just picked up, occupational hazards. Uh, it's got a list of 13 episodes where Johnny Dollar was shot. Um, so he's uh, uh, so really uh, did a lot of work on this, and I'll be referring to it as a resource. I don't know. I might. I might see if I can uh, maybe get him for an after-show interview sometime. I also do have a review of the app. Um, comment from a Beach Geek. A one-star review. I can't figure out how to view when not connected, and the links here don't lead to support. Apparently a waste of money, unless you have an iPhone. Um, uh, in reality, this, like a lot of apps, requires either an iPhone or an iPod Touch using Wi-Fi. Um, and I hate to see somebody making kind of a one-snap um, uh, judgment on that, because I think there's a lot of enjoyment, particularly once you've uh, already purchased it. If you purchase the app and uh, you enjoy it, I would really encourage you to leave a review so that uh, people can uh, know. And uh, if somebody is able to leave a review, uh, please just mention that uh, in order to use the internet, uh, to use the app, you just need the Wi-Fi. So, all right. Um, well, we're going to get into today's episode of Johnny Dollar. We've got several comments. I'm going to save them for after the show. Great comments. Um, right now, as of my recording, uh, Great Detectives is actually just one vote less than the old time Dragnet show. So, uh, can, thanks so much for everything you've done to help build momentum on the show. Uh, But we're going to go ahead and listen to uh, today's episode. This one is called The Little Man Who Wasn't All There. Oh, um, but before we do that, I do want to just remind you, as you make your travel plans, remember Johnny Dollar Air. Uh, If you don't have an action-packed expense account, uh, you need to make sure you get the best deal. And uh, JohnnyDollarAir.com, which is Priceline, will uh, help you to do that with the flexibility either name your own price or choose from a lot of public uh, published specials. But now let's get into today's episode. This one is uh, once again called The Little Man Who Wasn't All There. If you're looking for murder, I know a guy who can get it for you wholesale. <laughs> This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar, starring Charles Russell. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. (laughs) 
expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To West Coast Underwriters, San Francisco Branch, Attention Bradford L. Coates, General Manager. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my investigation of uh, the little man who wasn't all there, or in most cases, there at all, or the unpaid premium payoff. Expense account item one. Three cents postage due on your airmail special delivery letter containing said assignment. I can just hear you dictating it. Take a letter. To Johnny Dollar, you'll find his address in the files. Dear sir, better make that dear Dollar. Enclosed find copies of letters received by us from one Mr. James Yarbo, period. This man's wife was insured with our company until recently. One day before her death, her period of grace and an unpaid premium ran out. We canceled her policy in the amount of $20,000. Her husband, Yarbo, first made every effort to collect, then threatened us. Since then, we've received the enclosed series of letters intimating, without confessing, that he's had a hand in the accidental death of at least 12 of our policyholders to date. The police have been working on it, but they're getting nowhere. If you are available, please come immediately. Uh, uh, yours very truly, uh, so far. Expense account, item two, $176.87. Airfare, Hartford to San Francisco. Item three, 540. Cab fare, airport to your office. Dollar, glad you got him. You've no idea what okay, a mess is Okay, okay, Mr. Coates, okay, don't get excited. We'll nail this guy before you run out of policyholders. Well, the dozen he's apparently done away with already have cost us darn near quarter of a million. You've got to move fast, Dollar. The man is a homicidal maniac. Yeah, but a smart one, though. He's put just enough in those letters that he sent you to let you know that he's working on a grand-scale revenge against your company. But... He leaves out just enough so the law can't lock him up. He's had perfect alibis in every case. Uh, look, uh, Mr. Coach, tell me, have all these deaths been local right around here? No, they've been all over California. Mm-hmm. Well, one other thing, the method. From this list you gave me, Mr. Yarbo seems to have a preference for killing people through the noisy and gory method of fake automobile accidents. Yes, very true. But what about this last one? Airplane crash. That was a $30,000 loss to us. Just think, our poor innocent policyholder flying around and then his engine quit, thanks to a man he's never even seen. Tell me, Mr. Coates, <sighs> just how difficult would it be to get a list of your California policyholders, names and addresses, you know? Why, that would take days, but goodness gracious, man, you can't hope to keep an eye on them all. Besides, the minute you went off the job, he'd strike again. That's a preposterous Whoa, idea. Cut time. Look, I don't want the list. I was just wondering how Yarbo got it. Oh, now, so far you've given me nothing to go on. I'd like you to add two things to that. Yarbo's home address and a $50,000 life insurance policy made out to me. What on earth is that for? Well, look, in the first place, if we're going fishing for Mr. Yarbo, I might as well be the worm. In the second place, if I should get gobbled up in the line of duty, that $50,000 life insurance would make several attractive young ladies of my acquaintance very happy. Not, mind you, as happy as I can make them by remaining alive. Expense account, item four. $30. Rental of limousine complete with chauffeur. I figured if I was riding into trouble, I was riding in style. So I started on a house-to-house -house survey. You might say, knocking at death's door. Yes. What is it, the police? Oh, I'm sorry to bother you, Mrs. Chianelli, but I'm from the insurance company. Oh, yes. It'll only take a moment. One question about your son. Oh, poor Angelo. What do you want to know about my poor son? He drive away in his automobile. That's all. I'll never see him in life again. Yes, I, I know. Uh, tell me, Mrs. Chianelli, did you ever hear your son mention a man named Yarbo? Yarbo? Yeah. Yarbo. I don't know about no such Yarbo. Now, please. Please leave me. There was so much sadness in my house.
Yes? Uh, Mr. Dykes? Yes? I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm from the insurance company. About your son's plane crash. Oh. Thought all those details had been taken care of. Well, just one thing, Mr. Dykes. Did your son ever mention a man named Yarbo? Yarbo? Yeah. That's an unusual name. I'm sure if he had, I would have remembered. Okay, sir. I'm sorry to bother you. And thanks. <laughs> Yes, sir. May I help you? Yes, I'd like to have a word with Mrs. Weatherly. I'm from the insurance company. Well, sir, Mrs. Weatherly has been indisposed, not receiving visitors. Well, what is this like? Uh, how do you do, Mrs. Weatherly? My name is Johnny Dollar. Oh, dear, dear. You may go, Brian. Oh, I'm ashamed to let you see me in this condition, Mr. Dollar. Just ashamed. But you understand. I, I do indeed. Oh, it was bad enough. The, the accident, I mean. But the scandal! Oh! Oh, I'll never be able to hold my head up again. Yes. And uh, no. If Harvey had to get himself in an automobile accident, why, oh, why, I ask you, did he have to have that awful Mrs. Barclay in the car? Hmm? Oh, yes. Yes, it, it was very unthoughtful of him, yes. uh, Mrs. Weatherly. Would you mind answering one question? Well, if I can. Did your husband ever mention a man named Yarbo? Well, no. No, he never mentioned a man named Yarbo. But neither did he ever mention Mrs. Barclay. I tried a half a dozen of the other beneficiaries left behind by Mr. Yarbo's list of victims. All I got out of it was a very watery afternoon. The tears were falling like monsoon time in Burma. But of information, I got none. This brought me right smack up to a point I didn't want to have to reach. The point of contacting Mr. Yarbo in person. At 8.30 that night, I took a plan on Yarbo's house on Lombard Street. At 11.30, I saw the lights go out, as did Yarbo. He was a little guy, stooped over like he was looking for cigarette butts on a sidewalk, needing a haircut, and true to type, wearing a long black overcoat. But worst of all was the little satchel he was carrying. Items like this always set off a chain reaction in my imagination, and I could just see him on his way to atomizing the Oakland Bay Bridge, thus causing the biggest automobile accident in history. I very cleverly forced my way into the house by breaking a first floor window, reaching in and opening same. Cyclops' eye of my flashlight started picking up information on the subject of Mr. Yarbo immediately. The room I had entered looked like the hobby lobby of an English bobby, a crime museum if I ever saw one. On one wall, a gun case. On another, a crime library. And scattered around the room, a grisly collection, ranging from blood-stained hatchets to shrunken heads. But the most surprising criminal curio of all stood right behind me. Mr. Yarbo, complete with little black bag. Well, well, I must say, the current second story man dresses well, but I must also say you, my man, must have the old masters of the art turning in their graves. For you, young man, are a heavy-fingered bungler. Sir, let's have a better look at you. Now, that flashlight, I'll feel better after you've dropped it. Hey, what am I doing? You're not even pointing a gun at me. Don't feel too comfortable. You are well covered from many points. A step from you in any direction may detonate any number of explosive devices. Uh, why did I have to pick this joint to burgle? I feel like a city councilman playing a call in the White House. You seem more the kind of a guy I should be working for instead of on. What's your racket? Racket? Yeah. You were in a racket, my little friend. My pastime is a science. Yes, I, I take it you are impressed with my collection. Uh, uh, who, who wouldn't be? Well, if you're interested, come here. Uh, about those booby traps. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Note well the design in the rug. The large roses. Avoid stepping on them for the time being. Oh, great. And I was in here stumbling around in the dark. May your good luck continue. But look, look here in this case, the small vial on the right. That was purloined for me to order from the famous Black Museum in Scotland Yard. That little vial once rested in the case of the fabulous murderer, Dr. Crippen. 
And there, beside it, that lock of hair, mm-hmm. that is from the head of the second victim of the noted mass murderer, Neil Cream. And up there, look up there, the hangman's noose over the mantle, from that one swung the body of the notorious western bad woman, Fanny Turner. Oh, uh, how's chances for running this place for Halloween? Uh, well. Well, all right, then, since you no longer seem interested in playing the part of a bungling burglar, then I assume that I am also free to discontinue my pose as a victim of your disguise, Mr. Johnny Dollar. Oh. Ah, looks like the chips are down and I'm the fish. Yes, and there are a lot of other fish in your sea, Mr. Dollar. Poison eels, that's what you are, the lot of you. Parasites, gambling on death, and then not paying when you lose. Uh, listen, Mr. Yarbo, you're placing a big hunk of blame where it doesn't belong. You're confused about that. Confused? Yes. When your wife's insurance premium was overdue, you were allowed a 30-day period of grace. And when that went by, the policy was canceled. Now, that's not the insurance company's fault. It was your fault. But it wasn't. I gave her the money. She spent it on herself. I didn't make it up. I told them so after she died. I told them, but they wouldn't listen. I'll show you. I'll show you. The Arbo looked like he was headed to show me the chopping end of an axe laying on top of a small table. I hit him just as he hit the table. As he hit the floor, I noticed what I was standing on. One of those big red roses in the carpet. It hadn't exploded yet, but that was one flower I wasn't standing around waiting to see bloom. It took a lot of nerve picking up a telephone in that room. But I finally got a good hold on my nerves and a fair hold on an imitation of Yarbo's voice. Took one deep breath and picked up the phone. Yes? Hello, James. This is Martha. I'm at the office, and I have good news. Two more. Mr. and Mrs. Granville Morse, killed tonight on the Great Highway, two miles south of Seal Rock, 8.45 tonight. Ran into a post, both killed. Insured for a total of 80000 i got to go now. Goodbye, Jay. Well, congratulations, Brother Yarbo. Two more at 8.45 tonight. And who's your new alibi? Me. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, did you ever think of and as a comedy word? Maybe not. But you'll get a full demonstration on CBS this Wednesday night. There'll be Groucho Marx and his guest on that hilarious quiz, You Bet Your Life. For it's the guests who sometimes floor Groucho with their wisecracks. There'll be Bing Crosby in his regular Wednesday night CBS show and his special guest, Bob Hope. There'll be George Burns and Gracie Allen and Bill Goodwin. And, and becomes more filled with comedy when you tell or learn that Lum and Abner will have their premiere as Wednesday night regulars on most of these same CBS stations. Yes, this fall, you hear them all on C and B and S. Now, with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Yarbo might have been lying unconscious on the floor, but in that setting, I was still afraid of him. I'd have looked the place over with a fine tooth comb, only having none. I used my hands. I put the pat test to Yarbo's pockets for a gun. He was unloaded. Then turned my attention to the little black bag he'd been carrying when I saw him leave the house, and which he still had with him when he returned. I hoped it wasn't booby trapped. Opened it and discovered that it was a trap, the type my kind of booby stepped into. Inside the bag was a small radio receiver tuned to something I looked for and found in the room. A small radio transmitter of the type formerly used in army tanks. Through this, Yarbo had heard me enter his little museum of murder and had returned to catch me in the act of prowling the premises. About then, I caught him in the act of coming through. Well, welcome home, Yarbo. Time to get up. I just had a long chat on the phone with Martha. She thought I was you. You think you're very clever, don't you? 
Martha knows my voice. If she talked to you at all, she didn't tell you anything. Of that I am sure. So save your breath. There is no use your telling me she gave you any information. Oh, no, you've got me wrong, pal. I only told you Martha called to let you know I know there is a Martha. I figured it might make you nervous. And nervous men are easy to beat. Other nervous men may be easy to beat, Dollar, but not James the Arbo. The police have tried and they couldn't prove a thing against me. Now, may I have your permission to get up? Yeah. Maybe the police haven't been able to get anything on you, but I have something. Attempted murder. The hatchet you went for. <laughs> the pitiful mistake of a pitifully suspicious mind, Dollar. I wasn't reaching for that hatchet on the table. I was trying to show you something in the table drawer. There it is, spilled out on the floor. My wife's insurance policy. The one your unscrupulous thieving superiors refused to pay. The vampire. There, look at it. All in order. Much of it in fine print. Fine, just fine. <laughs> okay, Yarbo, that did it. Come on, ahead of me. Uh, where are we going? To find some place to lock you up. I was hired to stop you, and until I do, I'm at least going to try and slow you down. Now move. <laughs> Linen closet. No room here. Come on. In the bathroom. No window. Now, yeah, this will do. Go on, get in there. No, 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 not in here. Anywhere but in here. It's a good place. You make us thirsty. No, no, no. This is where my wife died. Not in here. No. Which on the surface may seem to have been a move on the cruel side. But Yarbo was a man obviously off his rocker, and I needed him more nervous than I already had him. Too nervous to attempt killing any more people. Spence account item five, a nickel. Phone call, downtown office, state police. A Mr. and Mrs. Granville Morse had indeed crashed to their death on the great highway south of Seal Rock at 845, which made the lady with the early telephone news flash, Martha, a gal with whom I wanted an early date. Come on, come on, answer the phone. Hello, hello? Hello. Uh, what is it? Hello, Mr. Coach, this is Dollar. Uh, oh, yes, Dollar. What do you want? Well, first I want to tell you that you just lost two more policyholders. List price, 80000 what Never mind that. I've also got something else on the good side. I need your help tonight. Uh, of course. Anything. What can I do? Meet me at your office. You and I are going to go looking for a dame named Martha. Martha? Martha who? I don't know. But I hope she works for you. I'll be there in a half hour. Make that 20 minutes and you'll be 10 minutes closer to happy days. <laughs> the office personnel records of the West Coast underwriters... Turned up not one, but three employees named Martha, which gave me three choices as to who had been supplying Yarbo with a list of West Coast policy, insurance, policy holders. Finding the exact Martha was even easier. On the phone, she had told me that she was calling from the office, and the night elevator operator's in and out book showed the signature of one Martha Kinsey, and I just couldn't wait to hear her report. <laughs> I've got a message from Mr. Yarbo. Oh, just a minute. Message from James? Oh, what does he want? Well, what he really wants is to get out of the bathroom. That's why I've got him locked up. Who are you? You ought to know who I am. I assume you're the one that told Yarbo he could be expecting a call from an insurance investigator named Dollar. Well, that's me. Well, I don't care. James told me girls give out lists of names all the time. Sell them for mailing lists. Ten cents apiece. May not be ethical, but it's not against the law. James told me, and I believe James. Oh, he's the smartest man I ever knew. He may be the smartest, but he's right in line to be numbered among the deadest. One of these fine mornings, the state is going to give him a cyanide egg for breakfast. What do you mean? You should know. Murder. 
Execution. Gas chamber. Well, you can't prove a thing. James told me so, and he knows. But he's smart. I hope he's not smart enough to pick a lock with a bath mat. Now, come on, sit down. You and I are going to have a nice, long talk. We are not. I won't say a thing. I don't have to, unless you have a warrant, an indictment, and a court reporter. James told me so. Yeah, I know. He's smart. But no matter what he told you, you're going to tell me a few things. Oh, no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. So, I was wrong. Martha didn't tell me anything. But her stubborn attitude did. She was in love with Mr. Yarbo, a stupid middle-aged woman having her last fling at romance, doing her best to keep her last chance alive in the person of the man who had made her his partner in crime. As crazy as it was, this grotesque pair of lovebirds created the only real emotion in the case to date and switched my thoughts from the widely scattered deaths which had brought me into the case and over to the single death of Yarbo's wife, and closed, find a transcript of statement made to me at 2 o'clock in the morning by the doctor who signed Mrs. Yarbo's death certificate. Cause of death, cerebral hemorrhage, result of severe fracture of skull, region medulla oblongata, contributing factors, woman bathing in bathtub at home, slipped and fell, striking head on shower spigot. Gone is finding death due to misadventure. Accidental. It took the doctor two minutes to get around to making that statement. I figured it would take Martha at least 30 minutes to get her hair out of her curlers and make herself presentable enough to risk being seen on the street. That left me 28 minutes to get back to Yarbo's house before she did. And I didn't need half that long. In a cab on my way over, I took inventory. One, to date, Yarbo's alibis covering him on all the so-called revenge murders had been perfect. Too perfect. Second... When I first faced Yarbo, he screamed about his wife's death, not in the light of having lost his lady love, but in the light of having lost her insurance money. Just as my third and most important conclusion came upon me, the taxi came upon our destination, and I had to go to work. Once inside the little horror house on Lombard Street, I got set for a long search. But it turned out to be a short one, and it proved two things. Yarbo was not only a murderer, he was as crazy as he'd acted in having kept the evidence around. Okay, Yarbo, come on out. Well, I hope you have enjoyed your waste of time, Mr. Dollar, as I've enjoyed my chance for meditation. You saw Martha, I suppose? Yes, I saw Martha. Bless her silent little soul. Yes, I was sure of Martha. She believed in me. You can say that again. Come on out here. Mr. Dollar, I suppose you are aware that this is the second time tonight you have been guilty of breaking and entering. I am, however, willing to forgive that should you come to your senses and decide to go back to Hartford and leave me alone. Uh-uh. Oh. Mm. Um, mind treading on the roses in the rug, Mr. Dollar? Sorry, Yarbo. I fell for that gag earlier tonight. People who smile at that joke give me the laugh laugh. Now, look, Yarbo. I know exactly what you've been up to, and I know why you've done it. But your little war of nerves has got to stop. It will never stop. No one can prove anything against me. I can. I can prove that you haven't done a thing to bring about those accidental deaths you've been taking credit for. Martha has sat down that insurance office, office and notified you every time there's been an accidental death of a policyholder in this part of the country. And you've written the company your little letters and gotten your little kicks out of it, right? That's a lie, lie, lie. This is a switch, a guy yelling that loud that he's guilty. You'll have to prove it. You will have to prove it. Don't worry, chum. I'm not going to waste a breath proving murders that you didn't commit. But, brother, I'm really going to go to town on the one that you did. Your wife, Mr. Yarbo. Oh, that is the most ridiculous statement you have yet made, young man. Look around you. Take note. I have profited by all the mistakes made by the original owners of these bloody souvenirs from Dr. Crippen on down. You see in me the living composite of them all. And I intend to stay that way. Alive. I'm afraid you will, but it's going to be inside an upholstered room. And this is what will put you there. Oh, God. Yeah, Mr. Yarbo, you carried your little hobby of crime souvenirs too far when you saved this hunk of pipe 
and the faucet with which you clubbed your wife to death. She slipped and fell. She was in the tub. I'm sure the police microscopes can give you a strong argument on that one. Now, oh, come on. And let's make it easy on each other, shall we? No, no, I didn't do it. I, I didn't do it. Let go. Whoa. Let go of me. You, you have to prove me. Don't help me, Martha. Help me. Hit him with something. I'd have bet on myself against the two of them if I didn't have to fight while playing hopscotch over those roses in the carpet about which I still wasn't quite sure. It was touch and go. Martha would try to touch the back of my head with something, and I'd go. Do something, Martha! Do something! I'll fix him! I'll fix him! Something Martha tried to do was pick up a heavy based urn and aim it at me. <laughs> she missed. He started to roll across the rosy carpet. When Yarbo saw where I was headed, he wrenched himself loose and dove the carpet. I dove the other way. He got there just too late. <laughs> I didn't have to look twice to know he was dead. Fate had called James Yarbo up on his own carpet. When Martha threw that urn at me, it had rolled straight for the only rose in the rug that had been booby traps. Which only goes to prove that sometimes a rose by any other name can be anything but sweet. <laughs> Expense account, item six. A dollar and forty cents. Three month subscription, Love Life magazine. Sent to accessory to murder, Martha Kinsey. To Hatchaby State Prison. I figured three months was about all she had. The judges and juries in California being rather efficient that way. Expense account, uh, item seven. Six bucks. Dinner and diving for pearls in a barrel of blue points at Fisherman's Wharf. Diving for Pearl's earring, which she lost while bending over the barrel trying to see what oysters looked like. Uh, item eight, $176.87. Airfare, San Francisco to Hartford. Uh, expense account total, $942.08. Not including defense lawyer fees if you decide to sue me for not being able to add correctly. Signed, yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell. Script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Jay Novello, Martha Wentworth, Paul Dubov, C.G. Pearson, and Larry Dobkin. The special music is written and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Be sure to be with us at this same time next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Everyone is concerned about world affairs these days. If we want world peace, we'll have to have national peace first. In order to keep America's strength and prestige, in order to preserve her freedom, we must do away with group prejudice. Let's stop judging people by the color of their skin or the place where they worship and start considering them for what they do. We'll be sure to have a happier world. Stay tuned now for Vaughn Monroe and his caravan, following immediately on most of these CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Welcome back. A very interesting closing ad. And you see that after uh, World War II, that was very much a recurring theme in uh, old time uh, in old time radio. Uh, the importance of racial and uh, re- religious uh, tolerance. Uh, I, I think some folks, when they went over uh, to the war and they they saw Nazi Germany, uh, they kind of, when they got home, got a, a little jarred. So, in, in some ways, I think what we saw happen. Uh, in American history, with the uh, uh, civil rights movement started through uh, start, started uh, the genesis of its success uh, through what people experienced in World War II, and certainly you see hear the, hear this long before uh, uh, w- w- the zenith of the civil rights movement. So uh, that that was a pretty interesting point. Uh, that and ad in the middle was kind of odd. I was. And as a comedy word, I was like, okay, well, it was a little cheesy, but memorable. So that could work for some audiences in terms of advertising. As for the show itself, I think this is another great one in the books. And um, part of being the host of this show is there's a mix. Uh, a, a lot of times there's a mix of bittersweet. On one hand, I am you know, eagerly anticipating being able to bring you the Edmund O'Brien episodes of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, because I think O'Brien was uh, phenomenal in an entirely different way than uh, Charles Russell was. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm going to miss episodes like this. Uh, really, they great script, great acting, fantastic plot twist, really just a top-notch episode. All right, now we have a few more comments on Podcast Alley before we uh, uh, before we wrap up. Adam keeps uh, this comes from Chris who writes. Adam keeps us interested with different stories every day. He plays the shows from beginning to end and has excellent replacements when a show ends. His commentary is excellent and helps put the time period in perspective. Keep up the good work, Adam. Thanks. And yeah, he had said on uh, Podcast Alley that he was. Um, uh, that he wasn't sure he was going to like Johnny Madero, so it was great to hear that. I love these shows. Thank you so much, Adam Graham, for making all of these uh, awesome shows available. Patsy Novak is my personal favorite, but they uh, really all are great. Adam just wanted to tell you that I love your podcast. I've been hooked on your Superman podcast for the past year, and only recently started listening to the great detectives of old time radio. I must say I'm addicted. I try to listen at least one episode a day, usually at work. And I don't really have a favorite. Not a big fan of Sherlock Holmes, though. The Pat Novak for Hire series is great, and I love the way the dialogue is written. Top notch. I really appreciate your commentary before and after each episode as well. You can tell you really are a fan of the genre, and I love the insights and the trivia you provide. Thanks, and keep up the great work. And that's from Jeff in Corinth, Mississippi. Uh, I just uh, and this one says I just love old time radio, especially old time detectives. Was glad to discover a podcast for strictly detectives, and uh, uh, and that's definitely one thing I was going for because there were some podcasts where it was potpourri, um, which could be good, but um, if you were looking for something specific, wouldn't work so well. So I'm glad to fill that need, and love the great detectives of old time radio, especially Johnny Dollar. I have an email from Jody. I recently started listening and I'm enjoying the podcast so far. I subscribed through Zoom and the image that appears is very long and is distorted and blurry on the MP3 player screen. It would be great if the podcast picture were square like the one on the Facebook page. Well, I went ahead and I updated the show image page to square. Um, it's the same one that was designed for our app. I really like that graphic. Um, so... I hope that solves the problem. Uh, She writes, I really like Johnny Dollar, and I'm glad you recently started with Johnny Madero. Thanks for the podcast. Well, thank you, Jody. Well, every 100 episodes, I want to bring you something special uh, in addition to our normal Monday through Friday lineup. And for uh, our first 100th episode special, we're bringing you the Maltese Falcon. Uh, Maltese Falcon uh, was a uh, a critical... Uh, story in the development of detective fiction. Written in 1930 by Dashiell Hammett, it created the hard-boiled school of, uh, of uh, crime detection. Um, of uh, Sam Spade, Hammett 
uh, said, Spade has no original. He is a dream man in the sense that he is what most of the private detectives I worked with would like to have been, and in their cockier moments thought they approached. For your private detective does not, and di or, or did not ten years ago when he was my colleague, want to be an erudite solver of riddles in the Sherlock Holmes manner. He wants to be a hard and shifty fellow, able to take care of himself in any situation, able to get the best of anybody he comes in contact with, whether criminal, innocent, uh, bystander, or client. Uh, and that's, uh, in a nutshell, the character of Sam Spade. Uh, the story uh, was a literary success, got made into a movie in 1931, um, also uh, was made into a lighter film in 1936. Um, Warner Brothers saw some uh, potential uh, for... Uh, uh, to, you know, re-release the 1931 version. But some of what the 1931 version contained was no longer uh, considered acceptable um, with, uh, with the Hayes Code. Uh, so they, they, clean, they cl cleaned it up a bit um, with uh, Humphrey Bogart in the lead role. And this was probably, along with... Um, uh, along with Ca uh, Casablanca and uh, and the Treasure of the Sierra Madre, this these were uh, some of the definitive roles for uh, Bogart, um, and and really uh, he, he just uh, it was a film that set set his career in pace, and of course after this uh, uh, Maltese Falcon came out, uh, you had uh, four different movies about. Uh, Philip Marlowe. Um, one thing, uh, Spade actually only appeared in one novel and uh, in three short stories, uh, and he w and he w wasn't the prototype of a lot of really good detectives thereafter. I think Sam Spade's a, a very hard uh, character to write and to make. Uh, actually care with and connect with. And even when they did the radio version, as I've listened to that, I've noticed they've kind of... Uh, the character isn't as um, ruthless um, um, or as de as detached um, on the radio uh, as, as he was uh, in the film. Uh and mo I think mo more of the radio detectives we've heard have had more in common with Philip Marlowe, but I think Spade uh, was definitely an influence, uh, particularly when you look at some of the uh, anti-heroes anti that emerged in detective fiction. Uh, there are several versions we could have used of uh, a Maltese Falcon. There was a Lux Radio Theater edition that's an hour, um, and we might someday play this. I chose this particular version because you've got the original stars. You've got Humphrey Bogart. You've got Mary Astor. You've got Peter Lorre and Sidney Greenstreet, all in their original roles. The only thing uh, you, you can caution right off is, uh, as always, when you're taking a, um, a two-hour movie... Um, uh, and adapting it to a 30-minute uh, radio play, you're going to lose something. So it's not all going to make 100% sense. Uh, if you're like this and you'd like to see the movie, I would encourage you to go to greatdetectives.net, click on the Netflix uh, banner on the right side of the page, get signed up for a two-week free trial, and you can ch check out the best of American cinema, be able to sample that uh, for a reasonable price, um, starting at eight ninety nine a month for unlimited plans. Uh, but let's go ahead and get into it. This one is from 1943, so right in the middle of World War II, it's the Maltese Falcon here on the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. presents the Screen Guild Players. The Screen Guild play tonight, 
The Maltese Falcon. The starring players, this is Humphrey Bogart. This is Mary Astor. This is Sidney Greenstreet. And this is Peter Lorre. Tonight, Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild players in Warner Brothers' sensational mystery story, The Maltese Falcon. It stars Humphrey Bogart as private detective Sam Spade, Mary Astor as Miss Wonderly, Sidney Greenstreet as Casper Gutman, and Peter Lorre as Joel Cairo. <laughs> This is the story of the Maltese Falcon and of the people whose lives it touched and seared. It began in San Francisco when a beautiful young woman who identified herself as Miss Wonderly walked into the offices of Spade and Archer, private detectives. Miss Wonderly had just told Sam Spade why she wished to engage detectives when Spade's partner, Miles Archer, entered the office. Oh, excuse me, Sam. Now, it's all right, Miles. Come in. Miss Wendley, this is Miles Archer, my partner. How do you do? Oh, I'm pleased to meet you. Miss Wendley's sister ran away from New York with a fellow named Floyd Thursby. They're here in San Francisco. Miss Wendley has seen Thursby and has a date with him tonight. Maybe he'll bring the sister with him. The chances are he won't. Miss Wendley wants us to find the sister, get her away from Thursby, and back home. But I want you to know that he's a dangerous man. I don't think he'd stop at anything. I don't believe he'd hesitate to kill Corinne, my sister, if he thought it would save him. Uh Uh-huh. What time is he coming to see you, Miss Wendley? After 8 o'clock. All right, Miss Wendley, we'll have a man there. Oh, I'll look after it myself. Thank you, Mr. Archer. Will uh, $200 be enough for a retainer? Oh, plenty. Oh, it'll help if you meet Thursby in your hotel lobby, Miss Wendley. I will. Thank you again. Goodbye. Well, Archer, what do you think of her? Sweet. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy shadowing her. Oh, okay, sucker. You call me if you run into any trouble. Hello? Yes, this is Spade. This is Lieutenant Dundee, Spade. What's on your mind, Copper? I thought you might be interested in knowing that your partner, Archie, was found in an alley near the St. Mark, shot through the heart from close range. Blast burned his coat. Can he down for a look at him before he's moved? No. You've seen everything I could. His gun was tucked away on his hip. It hadn't been fired. His overcoat was buttoned. Was he working, Sam? Well? He was supposed to be tailing a fellow named Floyd Thursby. What for? Now, now, don't crowd me. I'll see you after I break the news to Archer's wife. I'll be there in a couple of hours. Copper, come on in. Break the news to Archer's wife, Sam? Uh huh. What kind of a gun do you carry? None. I don't like them much. You don't just happen to have one on you. Search me. Turn the dump upside down if you want to. I won't squawk if you got a search warrant. Why were you tailing Floyd Thursby, Sam? I wasn't. Archer was. For the swell reason that we had a client who was paying good money to have him tailed. Who's the client? Sorry, I can't tell you that. You didn't go to Archer's house to tell his wife. I called up and the girl from your office was there and she said you told her to go. What are you leading up to? Just this, Spade. Floyd Thursby was shot down in front of his hotel about a half an hour after I talked to you. Oh. I came into my apartment just a few minutes ahead of you. I was walking around thinking things over. I knew you weren't here. I tried to get you on the phone. Where'd you walk to? Just around. Thursby die? Yeah. How'd I kill him? I forget. He was shot four times in the back. Hotel people know anything about him? Nothing. Except he'd been there a week. Alone? Alone. You find out who he was, what his game was? No, I thought you could tell me that. (laughs) I've never seen Thursby dead or alive. Now, look, Spade, you know me. If you did get Thursby, you'll get a square deal from me and most of the breaks. I don't know that I'd blame you a lot, man that kills your partner. But that wouldn't keep me from nailing you. That's fair enough. 
Now, would you mind scramming? I got some thinking to do, and I'd like to get a little sleep before daylight. Hello? Yeah, this is Sam Spade. Oh, I was just going to call you. Where are you? Well, the coronet on California Street, apartment 101. What's that? The name's Miss LeBlanc. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll be right out. <laughs> Come in, Mr. Spade. Mr. Spade, I have a terrible, terrible confession to make. That, uh, that story I told you yesterday was all just a story. Huh. Oh, that. Well, uh, <laughs> we didn't exactly believe your story, Miss, uh... Is your name Wonderly or LeBlanc? It's really O'Shaughnessy. Bridget O'Shaughnessy. Oh. Well, Miss O'Shaughnessy, as I said, we... We didn't exactly believe your story. We believed your $200. Oh? Yes, you see, you paid us too much to be telling the truth. You knew that when you accepted the money? Oh, I suspected it. I was positive when Joel Cairo called on me. Joel Cairo? Yeah. Yeah, he seems interested in Floyd Thursby, too. What did he say? About what? About me? Nothing. Well, what did he talk about? Well, he offered me $5,000 for a black statuette of a bird. He was pretty sure I had it or knew where it was. Do you? Oh, well, I think I know someone who does, and $5,000 is a lot of money. But right now, the police are trying to find out who hired us to tail Floyd Thursby. Mr. Spade, do they know about me? No, well, I don't think they do. I've been able to stall them so far. Must they know about me at all, Mr. Spade? Couldn't you manage somehow to shield me from them? Maybe, but I'll have to know what it's all about. I can't tell you now. Later I will, when I can. You must trust me, Mr. Spade. Oh, I, I'm so alone and afraid. I've got nobody to help me if you won't help me. Be generous, Mr. Spade. You're strong. You're brave. You can spare me some of that strength and courage, surely. <laughs> Sister, you don't need much of anybody's help. You're good. Chiefly your eyes, I think, and that throb you get in your voice when you say things like, be generous, Mr. Spade. All right. I deserve that. But the lie was in the way I said it, and not at all in what I said. Ah, now you are dangerous. Still, Cairo offered me $5,000. It's far more than I could ever offer you if I must bid for your life. And <laughs> yeah, that's good coming from you. Have you given me any of your confidence, any of the truth? I can't go ahead without more confidence in you than I have now. Can't you trust me just a little while? Well, how much is a little? And what are you waiting for? I must talk to Joe Cairo. Oh. Well, you can see him tonight. I know where to reach him. Oh, he can't come here. I can't let him know where I am. I'm, I'm afraid. Yeah, we'll all meet at my place, then. All right. <laughs> I'm delighted to see you again, Mr. Shaughnessy. I was sure you would be, Joe. Mr. Spade told me about your offer for the Maltese Falcon. How soon can you have the money ready? Oh, it is ready. You are ready to give us $5,000 if we turn the Falcon over to you? I shall be able to give you the money as soon as uh, the bank opens in the morning. But I haven't got the Falcon. Then why did you send for me? Because I'll have it in another week. Yes? Where is it? Where Floyd hid it. If you know where he hid it, why, why must we wait a week and why are you willing to sell it to me? I'm afraid. After what happened to Floyd, I'm afraid to touch it except to turn it over to somebody else right away. Exactly what did happen to Floyd? The fat man. Gottman? Is he here? I don't know. I suppose so. Uh, if you two let me interrupt for a second, I can answer that. Gutman is here. How do you know? Because he called me and asked me to see him. Have you? Not yet. I thought that after our friend Cairo here left, I'd find out just how you and I stand before I took on any more clients. Now, do you know how you and I stand, Sam? Yeah. 
if I can believe anything about you. But you're such a liar. I am a liar. I've always been a liar. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't brag about it. Was there any truth at all in that yarn you were telling me about Thursby and the Falcon? Some. Not very much. Well, we've got all night before us. Oh, I'm, I'm so tired. So tired of lying and thinking up lies and not knowing what is a lie and what is the truth. I wish... Now look, honey. I think I'd better have a talk with Gutman in the morning. <laughs> Now, Mr. Gutman, shall we talk about the falcon? No. Oh, by all means, Mr. Spade. But first, sir, answer me a question. Are you here as Mr. O'Shaughnessy's representative? Well, there's nothing certain about it either way yet. It depends. Maybe it depends on Joel Cairo? Maybe. The question then, Mr. Spade, is which you'll represent. It will be Mr. O'Shaughnessy or Mr. Cairo. I didn't say so. Who else is there? There's me. <laughs> oh, well, that's wonderful, sir, wonderful. I do like a man who tells you right out he's looking out for himself. Don't we all? Uh-huh. Now let's talk about the blackbird. Let's, Mr. Spade. Have you any conception of how much money can be got out of that blackbird? No, but you just tell me what it is and I'll figure out the profits. You mean you don't know what that bird is? Well, I know it's black enamel and about a foot high and I know the value in human life you people put on it. Mr. O'Shaughnessy didn't tell you what it is? He offered and me... Cairo didn't either? He offered me 10000 for it. Do either of them know what that bird is, sir? What is your impression? Well, there's not much to go by, but uh, I don't think so. If they don't know, I'm the only one in the whole wide, sweet world who does it. Good. And when you tell me, there'll be two of us. <laughs> Mathematically correct, sir. But I don't know for certain that I'm going to tell you. Well, you think again and think fast. You'll do your talking today. You're through. What are you wasting my time for? I can get along without you. That remains to be seen, Mr. Spade. That are away. And there's another thing. Keep that gunman of yours away from me while you're making up your mind or I'll kill him. <laughs> well, sir, I must say you have a very violent temper. Think it over. You've got till 5.30. Then you're either in or out for keeps. Wilma. I'm going to kill that guy. I could have done it easy when he was standing there with his back to me. Of course you could, my boy. But business before pleasure. And we'll be seeing Mr. Spade again before 5.30. So ends Act One of the Maltese Falcon, starring Peter Lorre, Sidney Greenstreet, Mary Astor, and Humphrey Bogart. Act Two in just a moment. But first, here's a word from our hostess, Lady Esther. Some weeks ago, I was being shown through a shipyard, one of the largest in the country, and stopped to chat with a young woman wearing a safety mask. It gave her a stern, rather severe look. But when she removed the mask to chat with me, she was young and blonde and very lovely. Her skin looked so dainty and fresh that I just couldn't resist saying, My, you look as though you just stepped out of a bandbox. She laughed and said, Oh, wife, I've been on the job since early this morning, and I haven't even had time to repowder my face. But after all, I do use your powder, you know. Of course, she's only one of millions of busy, important women who use Lady Esther face powder. Partly because of its remarkable clinging quality. They explain that when they use Lady Esther face powder, they have the comfortable feeling that their skin always looks smooth and fresh, never streaked, caked, or shiny. But that's only one of the reasons why more lovely women now use Lady Esther face powder than any other kind. There are two other important reasons. First, the texture of my powder is so flattering that it hides little lines and blemishes, makes your skin look younger. And second, the shades of Lady Esther face powder are so rich, vivid, and alive, they give new interest, a look of new beauty to your skin. And both the unusual texture and the flattering shades are the result of my patented twin hurricane method of making face powder. So if you'd like to have your skin look softer, smoother, younger, and look that way for hours at a time, just try Lady Esther face powder. And now the curtain rises on the second act. 
Spirit of the Maltese Falcon, starring Humphrey Bogart as Sam Spade, Mary Astor as Bridget O'Shaughnessy, Sidney Greenstreet as Casper Gutman, the fat man, and Peter Lorre as Joel Cairo. <laughs> Late in the afternoon, following Sam Spade's visit to Gutman's apartment, a dying man staggered into Spade's office and collapsed on the floor. He died before he could speak to Spade. But his papers identified him as Captain Jacoby of the steamship La Paloma. And clutched to his bullet-torn chest was the Maltese Falcon. After depositing the Falcon in a railroad station check room and mailing the identification check to his private post office box, Sam met Bridget O'Shaughnessy and took her to his apartment. No, Sam, I never would have placed myself in this position if I hadn't trusted you completely. Oh, that again? But you know that's so. Uh, you don't have to trust me as long as you can persuade me to trust you. But Sam, darling... Oh, well, I think we'd better let it go at that until we see what happens after Gutman gets here. The fat man? Here? Certainly, why not? Anyway, that should be him. So it's too late to change our plans. I'll be right back. Oh, hello, Gutman. Good evening, sir. I see you brought company. I can understand the gunman, but I didn't know Cairo was a friend of yours. No, <laughs> we're old acquaintances. Now that we're all here, let's go in and sit down and be comfortable and talk. Oh, sure. Come on in. Now, look, Angel. Gutman brought a couple of friends along. Good evening, Mr. Shaughnessy. Hello, Joe. You look unusually charming this evening, my dear. Thanks. The uh, gunsel doesn't talk, Angel. Get away from me, punk. Stand still and shut up. Listen, you're not going to frisk me, touch me, and I'm going to make you use that gun. Ask your boss if he wants to be shut up before we talk. Never mind, Wilma. <laughs> you're certainly a most headstrong and unpredictable individual, Mr. Spade. Now, why did you send for me? You ready to make the first payment and take the falcon off my hands? The falcon? That's right, Angel. I've got it. Well, sir, I have in this envelope $10,000. 10000 Oh, we were talking about more money than that. Yes, sir, we were, but there are more of us to be taken care of now. <laughs> well, that may be, but I've got the falcon. I shouldn't think it would be necessary to remind you, Mr. Speed, that uh, though you may have the falcon, yet we certainly have you. Yes, I'm trying not to let that worry me, but uh, let the money wait. There's another thing to be taken care of first. We've got to have a fall guy. A bigger pardon? Police have got to have a victim, somebody they can stick for those three murders. Two, two. Only two murderers, Mr. Spade. Thursby undoubtedly killed your partner. All right, all right, two then. Well, the point I've got to give the police, a victim when the time comes. If I don't, I'll be it. Uh, let's give him, uh, let's give him Wilmer here. Why, you dirty He rat. actually did shoot Thursby and Jacoby, didn't he? Anyway, he's made to order for the part. Let's turn him over to them. <laughs> By God, so you are a character, that you are. <laughs> There's ever, never any telling what you'll say or do next, except that it's bound to be something astonishing. Well, it's our best bet. With him in their hands, the police will forget the rest of us. Your plan is not at all practical, sir. Let's not say anything more about it. All right. I have another suggestion. Let's give him Cairo. Well, by God, sir. I suppose we give him you, Mr. Spade, or, or Mr. Shaughnessy. How about that, huh? Sam, you wouldn't. You people want the fork, and I've got it. A fall guy is part of the price I'm insisting on. You seem to forget you're not in a position to insist on anything. No? If you kill me, how are you going to get the falcon? By God, sir, you are a character. <laughs> well? Well, what else can I do? I'm sorry, Wilma. Terribly sorry. I want you to know that I couldn't be any fonder of you if you were my own son. But, well, if you lose a son, it's possible to get another. And there's only one Maltese falcon. You rat, I'll kill you for this. Thank you, Mr. Spade. When you're as young as Wilma, one simply doesn't understand these things. <laughs> and how about some coffee, Bridget? Put the pot on, will you? I don't like to leave my guests. Surely. Anything to get out of here. Now, sir, let's get down to business. I ought to have more than 10000 Of course, sir, you understand this is the first payment. You still don't understand the falcon's worth. Well, a black enamel bird can't be worth millions. But it is. Otherwise, I should not have spent 17 years of my life trying to uh, acquire it. The black enamel you refer to, sir, is merely camouflage, covering a solid gold bird encrusted from head to foot with the finest jewel. Okay. So I get millions later. How's about 15,000 now? Frankly and candidly, and on my word of honor as a gentleman, 
ten thousand I gave you is all the money I can raise right now. Yeah, but you didn't say positively. <laughs> positively. Well, if that's the best you can do, it's the best you can do. But it's understood the punk has to stand as the fall guy. That is part of our agreement, sir. Okay, I'll make a phone call. The falcon will be here in an hour. <laughs> This is not the Maltese falcon. This is a lead imitation covered with the same enamel. See where I've shaved it off with a knife lead? Pure lead. You bungled it. You, Gutman. You and your stupid attempt to buy it from the Russian who owned it. He caught on to how valuable it was. No wonder we had so little trouble stealing it. You, you imbecile. You, you bloated idiot. Well, sir, what do you suggest? Shall we stand here and shed tears and call each other names? Hmm. Or shall we pay the Russian another call in Istanbul? Uh, are you going? Seventeen years I've wanted that little item, and I intend to get it. Another year? Well, sir, that will be an additional expenditure of time on only five and fifteen seventeenths percent. I go with you. Good. And Wilma? Wilma, he... Where? Where is the boy? He must have had made his getaway while we were unwrapping the fog. A swell lot of thieves. Well, sir... I left to ask you to return my 10000 I held up my end. It's your hard luck, not mine, if you didn't get what you wanted. I'm sorry, but I must insist. Oh, a hideout gun, huh? Okay. Thank you, sir. The shortest farewells are the best. And you. And to you, Miss O'Shaughnessy, I leave the fake fault and falcon as a little memento. <laughs> Come, girl. Hello, police department. Lieutenant Dundee there, put him on. Tell him Sam Spade's calling. Now, look, Angel. Gutman and Cairo will talk when the cops nail them about us. We've only got minutes to get set for the police. Now, give me your whole story fast. Well, where... Where shall I begin? Uh, the day you first came to my office... Why did you want Thursby shadowed? I, I suspected him of betraying me to Gutman, and I wanted to find That's out. That's a lie. Gutman tried to make a deal with him. You had Thursby hooked, and you knew it. You wanted to get him out of the way before Captain Jacoby arrived with the falcon. Isn't that so? What was your scheme? I thought if he saw someone following him, he might be frightened into going away. Now look, Archer hadn't many brains, but he wasn't clumsy enough to be spotted the first night. You must have told Thursby he was being followed. I told him, yes. But please believe me, Sam, I wouldn't have told him if I'd thought Floyd would kill him. If you thought he wouldn't kill Archie, you were right, Angel. Didn't he? Archie had been a detective too long to be caught shadowing a man up a blind alley with his gun tucked away in his hip and his overcoat button. But he'd have gone up there with you, Angel. He was just dumb enough for that. Sam. And then you could have stood as close to him as you like there in the dark. Put a hole through him with a gun you'd gotten from Thursby that evening. Don't, don't talk to me like that, Sam. You know I didn't. Now, the police will be blowing in any minute now, Angel. Talk. Oh, why do you accuse me of such a terrible... Why did you shoot Archer? I thought Thursby would tackle him and one or the other would go down. If Thursby was killed, then you were rid of him. If it was Archer, then you could see that Thursby was caught. Was that it? Something. And when something you find like out that. that Thursby didn't mean to tackle Archer, you borrowed the gun and did it yourself, right? I guess so. I know so. You didn't know Gutman was here looking for you until you learned Thursby was shot. Then you needed another protector. So you came back to me. Yes, but... Oh, sweetheart, it wasn't only that. I, I would have come back to you sooner or later. From the very first instant I saw you, I knew that... Ah, oh, you angel. Well, if you get a good break, you'll be out of San Quentin in 20 years. Sam, you're not... Yes, angel. I'm going to send you over. But if they hang you, I'll always remember you. Don't, Sam. Don't say that. Even in fun. It's not fun. I happen to be in the detective business, and you killed my partner. Bad business to let the killer get away with it. Bad for every detective in this country. You're taking the fall. You've been playing with me, only pretending you cared to trap me like this. You didn't care at all. You don't love me. Uh, I... I think I do. But what of it? I won't play the sap for you. You know it's not like that. You can't say that. I am saying it. You know down deep in your heart, you know that in spite of everything I've done, I love you. I don't care who loves who. You killed Archer. 
You're going over for it. Come in. Oh, hello, copper. Hello, Sam. You got Gutman and Cairo? We got Cairo. Gutman's dead. Kid Wilmer had just finished shooting him when we got there. So I ought to have expected that. You better put the cuffs on Angel, copper. We're taking her down to the station. What charge? Damn. Murder. She shot Miles Archer. Oh, and you better bring that blackbird along, too, copper. It's part of the evidence against Cairo. Hey, this is heavy. What's it made of? The, uh, stuff that dreams are made of. And so ends the story of the Maltese Falcon. Thank you, Mary Esther, Humphrey Bogart, Sidney Greenstreet, and Peter Laurie for appearing with the Lady Esther Screen Guild players tonight... And also for telling us the most exciting story. It was our pleasure, Mr. Bradley. We all had a wonderful time making the picture, and the radio version tonight brought back some wonderful memories. Then, too, knowing that the benefits from these programs to support the motion picture country house and clinic give us an added incentive. And now, before we tell you about next week's program, here's a word from one of America's best-known beauty authorities, Lady Esther. Thank you, Miss Arthur. Lady... You know, it's surprising the number of letters new users of Lady Esther face powder have sent me in the last few months. So many of them say the same thing, that Lady Esther face powder is an entirely different kind of powder, that it does wonderful things for the appearance of the skin, <clears throat> makes it look softer, smoother, and often years younger. Well, Lady Esther face powder is more flattering, more becoming, because my powder isn't just mixed, just blended like ordinary face powder. It's made by a method new, unique, exclusively mine. You see, Lady Esther face powder is blown at whirling speed by my famous twin hurricanes. Yes, my patented twin hurricane process blows and whips color and powder particles together until they're evenly married, blended into a fine, smooth, sheer mist of beauty, finer in texture and truer in shade than powder ever made by ordinary methods. That's why Lady Esther face powder smooths down so much more evenly. And why the shades of my powder are so clear and alive, they make your skin younger looking, more vivid, far lovelier. Why don't you try Lady Esther face powder and see how much happier you'll be with the appearance of your skin? Before we tell you about next week's program, Humphrey Bogart has a word to say from our government. As you all know, the third war loan drive is on full steam. The drive to back the attack our fighting forces are making against our enemies. As our share toward victory, we at home must buy $15 billion worth of war bonds, which means each one of us must dig down deeper into our own pockets. Each of us must buy at least one extra bond this month. We have to win this war, and we will win, all right. But how soon we win is up to every one of us. So buy an extra war bond this week, sure, to help speed our day to victory. Next week, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players will present highlights from Warner Brothers' great new musical picture, Thank Your Lucky Stars. It will star Joan Leslie, Dennis Morgan, Dinah Shore, and Eddie Cantor. Be sure to listen. Humphrey Bogart can soon be seen in the Warner Brothers' production, Thank Your Lucky Stars. Mary Astor is currently playing in the Metro Golden Mayor Technicolor production, Thousands Cheer. Sidney Greenstreet and Peter Laurie appeared through the courtesy of Warner Brothers. Music on tonight's program was arranged and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. To help your government save tin, buy the larger size of Lady Esther face cream, and at the same time, you will save yourself money to invest in war bonds and stamps. Truman Bradley speaking for Lady Esther. Thank you. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. One other aspect I like about this particular version um, is that is that it comes in the middle of World War II. And indeed, this per, uh, particular uh, episode of the Screen Guild Theater was um, actually uh, broadcast um, 
uh, over the armed forces uh, radio. So it's something, uh, something as well that was made for our uh, troops to watch overseas. And that incredible uh, sense of unity. Uh, so a timeless story, um, not as uh, not as uh, not as complete as those who've seen the the full film. Um, I, I miss you know there were quite a few few scenes I I, I, I miss the the scene where Cairo and Spade uh, first meet was a classic. And of course, my favorite Cas- Casper Gutman line's not in there. I'm a man who likes talking to a man who likes to talk. However, you can't get it. You can't get everything. So, all right. Well, we're going to wrap it up. Got any comments? Send them to me. Box13 at greatdetectives.net. Um, and again, cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley. We'll see you back here on Monday with Box13. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.